This is live. Welcome, welcome, everybody. On that, I do believe that I have quite been able to do that proper. Also, Welcome, welcome, everybody. Hope you all are having a very blessed day today. Uh, it is a Sunday. It is uh, the fourth, or uh, is it the fourth, fifth, fourth today? So six days until the next APEC, the first APEC of year three coming up next weekend. Going to be epic. But uh, that's uh, not what I promised today. Today, I have promised you all megaliths, uh, pyramids, ooparts, uh, antiquitech, and the rest. So let's get into that. Why did the picture not open? Here we go. Will it work now? Yes, yes, it looks like it will. Okay. Is it what? Come on. Is it good? There we go. Okay. So, uh, this right here, supposedly, like clear, uh, what I suspect would be geopolymer brickwork, obviously, uh, with this polygonal megalithic uh wall structure and uh can anyone guess where this is this right here and can you hear me now uh how is the sound uh, now that the music has stopped um but any guesses in the live chat where this polygonal wall megalithic wall is located because it turns out I'm going to let you put your answers in. All right. If maybe there's a delay. Uh, it's in Montana. This is in Montana, which is right below me in uh, southwestern Alberta, Canada. Montana border borders me. And this is supposedly in the Rocky Mountains, Montana. So, uh, yeah, what a shock. And... Not just this one, we have more. Uh, the, oh my, it's being low. Oh, that, sorry, wrong way. Is it going to work now? My computer is being really slow. Sorry, everyone. Not sure why. Okay. Um, I guess I'm just going to have to open up each one individually. And this is going to be a pain in the butt, unless it wants to actually work. Oh, there we go. It's changing. Finally, yes. Yeah, so this one also, right? Oh, it looks like just boulders. It's natural. No, look at that perfect angle. And we see these in those geopolymer uh, polygonal megalithic walls. This also in Montana here, 
and like they say giants playground and i believe it uh this stuff is it had to have been made by giants because it is all absolutely giant and it's from a time of uh, people long long ago the time of the younger dryas event and before then when there was the mega fauna okay we had the saber tooth tigers the mammoths the mastodons uh, the different dinosaurs or dragons, you know, so giant insects they have found, uh, the invertebrates of the sea, everything just absolutely huge. So, of course, there was giant humans of that time, too. So this one also in Montana, USA, and all around the world, uh, right? Liquid stone, exactly, Diet Dazzle, uh, when they poured it, the geopolymer techniques, uh, Gary Baxter, hello, Daryl Calhoun, welcome, Cassandra, uh, Crystal Shaman, Huru TV, and Matt, F Graph, Atlant Antediluvian American, Esra, Mindful Exposures, welcome, sister, Marcia Lee, uh, I said Huru TV, I'm pretty sure. A, a holiday. Uh, a Samuel Kerr. A Johnny Bones. Yes. Sinandra and gotta find. That's just me, Brian Evans, and of course, love. And I love you all. And now that I have gone through everyone, geopolymer history, well, that's the synchronicity. We are showing geopolymer and uh, exactly the topic that is on screen. Cassandra, there we go. Sorry. And if I've butchered anybody's names, my apologies. Is there fossils? Uh, is there any fossils of giant humans? 1,000% there is. It is called biogeology. Uh, and I would even say that there is uh, a chance uh, just at first glance, okay, that if this isn't geopolymer, this could be biogeology and potentially a uh, fossilized uh, giant or titan. But uh, most likely, I believe it's... Uh, a cast um, <clears throat> like um, statue of uh, former giants, but uh, Stellium Seven, uh, my good friend Mike. I'm going to be ha doing an episode with Stellium very soon, uh, and he is the expert on uh, this biogeology, as he has rightfully. Uh, labeled it and dubbed it. Sean, welcome. Taryn Earthling, welcome. Uh, Simula Care. Oh man, I'm sorry, I'm butchering things today. Uh, hidden in the Smith Sm Smithsonian basement. Yes, it is. Sorry, that right there is uh, guilty of cotton mouth. Uh, what happens when Bernie uh, the Burncron Canadian smokes too much pot before uh, starting a stream and having to speak uh, for God knows how many hours we're going to go for? All right. Anyways, so if this isn't blowing your mind because it absolutely has blows my mind and re-blew my mind right before... Uh, we went live here when I refound this and looking at them that this is so close to me. So that uh, first, we I'm going to be going in the next week or two, finally, one to two weeks from now, uh, probably two weeks more likely. Uh, and I'm going to be uh, putting all the details out and planning it uh, in the next uh, few days here. Uh, in the coming streams as we put it together, but going to the Medicine Hat Badlands Guardians locations here uh, to investigate uh, this site and uh, get the drone up and look at all of these different uh, ancient faces, sculptures, these geoglyphs from the sky, uh, identical essentially to uh, what's down in Peru, 
uh, Bolivia and throughout all of uh, South America, really, and uh, Central America and North America, as it shows. Uh, this one, clearly what looks like uh, Muay and uh, Easter Island uh, heads, potentially, of the di Hawaiian and uh, different Micronesian, Polynesian, essentially Lumerian peoples uh, and cultures, races, islands that are left over of those kingdoms. Uh, also in this one, you can see the Olmec on the top, as well as the indigenous Western Plains uh, Aboriginal warrior, and what looks like a potential uh, Viking or even ogre or something uh, on top of the very, very top of the head. Hilarious. I forgot that my microphone and my cell phone is on outside. And I was like, where is that bird coming from? And, but no, of course, that's outside. The magpies and uh, the crows is what you've been hearing. Uh, and that is the microphone you're hearing of the bird showing the different monoatomic um, colloidal ormus, also known as GANs, uh, materials uh, that I'm going to be doing all of the electroculture or agricultural uh, tests with today, uh, later today, actually going to set up uh, the second location uh, and officially getting the trials beginning and uh, watered and in the ground and it will be interesting. All right, so yes, this is what we call geoglyphs and the geoglyph radials. This is another satellite image uh, of this Medicine Hat Badlands uh, area and what Arthur Fairham, the um, discoverer and I guess um, a rediscoverer and uh, lead professor academic on the science of geoglyphology, this lost ancient high-tech mapping uh, technology and system that, uh, you know, it's visible only from high, high above. Now, whether it's uh, astral travel or, uh, you know, dreamland or airships, blimps, UFOs, plasmas, uh, whatever need be drones, uh, it's that it's from above that this mapping system really uh, was built for on this macroscopic terraforming scale uh, of this entire valleyways uh, that they did and made these sites and uh, did this raised earthenworks of these lines uh, and angles that uh, plot out to the different radials that create this uh, territorial map, these exact uh, topographical locations around the world, like the tip of Greenland, um, Hawaii, uh, you've got the Giza pyramids, you've got the Bosnian pyramids, you got like the tip of Finland and Norway, uh, you've got Mexico City, uh, you've got, what is that, the Canary Islands or uh, in Cuba, like so many different uh, actual places that are precisely plotted out uh, around the world by this geoglyphology mapping um, ancient earthenworks uh, that Arthur Ferrum has found and that it is uh, a key part of the Medicine Hat Badland Guardian site. And it was Arthur Ferrum who originally uh, discovered and brought uh, notice and fame to the Medicine Hat Badland Guardians, uh, even though he's not officially given credit for it anymore. Or like he is like officially recognized, but like on the internet, you will hear so many other people take claim and like try to not give it to him, but it's documented that uh, he started his research on it and uh, decoding all of the these uh, five geoglyph radial sites um, almost a decade before uh, 
like he published his work on it over a decade before uh, it started trending or got uh, discovered on the internet basically and this right here is a larger uh, overall um, site of the valley sites of uh, the potentially 10 different uh, huge faces sculptures uh, whatever they are and that uh, whatever peoples or culture society that built this macroscopic site of uh, geoglyphology and putting their literal faces into the landscape or was this uh, a flood was this an abs was this the death of the titans is this uh, you know could this be uh, a tight titan bodies who knows that's what we're gonna go investigate uh you know that could just be as likely that you know the story of uh the old testament and um you know the floods of noah that the giants all drowned this you know could this be a a site or a massacre of, of them and then that the uh indigenous uh people afterwards came in and made these new geoglyphs uh who knows uh, that's just straight speculation right I, I more likely believe that it was not necessarily these being titans but rather the giants of that time frame uh created these terraformed uh mega sites and uh structures maybe in memory of the titans past uh that said i have seen many many images of uh what are mountains that resemble uh actual titans uh and that uh they, there's several of these um you know mountain titan sites around the world all uh, recognized by their local cultures as these holy rest sleeping titan mountains and that uh you know the quite possible that they're re real you know like uh, it you know they are 1000 percent real and that they exist and that they are these giant mountains that are actually shaped as titans the question is are they the remains of actual titans or did some other uh, society peoples come in with the mega technology to then do the earthworks and terraforming to make them sculpt the mountains into these monuments of titans if they're not actual titans uh what i have up right now uh, is the topographical map of the Grand Canyon Pyramid Complex. Uh, as you see, uh, each of the peaks of these uh, pyramids and temples, uh, they perfectly align with all of the heavenly stars above in the entire Orion constellation as well as the corresponding stars that are also in the sky but not part of uh, orion himself uh, each one of the temple peaks perfectly aligning with them and that they all have uh, the sacred names such as isis temple and uh, shiva temple buddhist pier temple or um Several of them are called pyramids. There's um, Apollo Temple, uh, Jupiter Pyramid, the Ottoman Amphitheater. Um, there is Solomon's Temple uh, within this complex here in the Grand Canyon. Uh, it is absolutely astounding. Uh, this is the map. Uh, I need to get a higher resolution image of it, which literally uh, names all of the 50 different um, mountain pyramid structures. It, it's absolutely nuts. It, it's a 
macro sized mega ancient civ like terraformed super city structure like it and the legends and rumors of it you know still existing underground and if there are such things as like ant people or uh reptoids or elongated skull folk or you know everything in between it would be uh underground in these ancient uh mega sites places that uh, they would still exist and is that why this is a no-go zone is that why uh they literally uh went in and you can see here uh the wall there there used to be a giant opening cave into isis temple here uh why did the u.s government have to go in and cover this entrance up this is isis temple look at that giant opening why would they spend the resources to go cover up the that that cave and entrance like each of these are stepped uh like pentagon and octagonal uh, ancient pyramids that uh, most likely uh, there would have been, they had this whole area dammed, just like they have dammed up the, with the Hoover Dam. And the thing is, is that in that area, they flooded it to cover up uh, the ancient city that was there. And, uh, you know, it would have been a lower water level while inhabited, but this area would have been flooded and that it would have been like this giant lake of Venetian pyramid uh, mountain sort of villa existences uh, that you can see that they went up to different levels of the water level possibly there. And that that would have been the star fort, star citadel sort of way. Uh, that's just speculation, but what I suspect and have found evidence of uh, and that this is all in that same red sandstone, red limestone, white limestone claimed layers that uh, shout out to Paul Cook and all of his work on the geopolymer that he has found in what he calls his blueprint of these ancient uh, megalithic layers. And that this is that same red, white layered uh, material that this entire uh what do you call it geological formation or mega super city civilization uh one or the other but that's what it's made out of here's a second topographical map of it once again showing each of the peaks perfectly aligning uh to the different stars in the orion system and uh, if that's not enough, there's also this crazy alignment of the Orion zone, uh, this, which uh, the Grand Canyon being to the left and then to the right, uh, Arizona, I believe it is. Yes, there set out and all of the current cities and again, oh, into the Grand Canyon again. Uh, there we go. And it's just uh, repeating on a macro scale over and over again. And, you know, and it connects exactly to this place and Sam Asmanovich, Dr. Sam Asmanovich's work. And that uh, these were the Atlantean, the Lemurian, super civilization pyramid builders that existed before us and that they were most likely giant people uh and that they existed during the megafauna times and they were the demigods and they probably still exist underground in there today as the legends tell so yes in the next coming weeks I am finally going to this place. We are investigating it. We are checking it out. We're going to verify all of these ancient lines, the uh, geoglyph radials, the earthenworks, 
Uh, we are going to do a camping trip out there as well as YouTube meetup and weekend. Making a weekend of it, we're going to try to, anyone that wants to join, do a rent motel spot in Medicine Hat and then do day camping out here because I don't know if it's legal or not to camp out there, be out there, but uh, potentially also stay out there and others, you know, if you want to, on your own risk, do camp out there and stay out there by all means, you know, we'll join you each day. And there's also this guy part of it and clearly another road going up to it because uh, when we look at the overall size, it's a massive valley uh, of uh, different structures. So uh, there's the main road coming out, another side road below that guy. So the big nose, Birdman stuff, and the what he's called alien coming out of head but uh it's also the aztec dragon headdress known as and what also he's labeled as another alien head uh nice roads going through there that look like uh, government or public roads and then uh the badlands guardian uh up there is the oil road uh service road and that it goes connects through uh well that portion isn't on this map pictured here anywho uh here we go now you can see it as it comes up connecting from that road uh right so we'll probably we've got a lot of options of where to camp because they could do at the badland guardian site itself or if that's private property uh by the birdman or the aztec dragon uh alien head sites uh also supposedly this these guys right here the balls you know these megalithic perfect ancient balls also were this is supposedly filmed inside the medicine hat badlands uh area here so uh, I also hopefully will get to take some pictures and claim a couple of Bernie's balls. Bernie's megalithic balls uh, hopefully shall be claimed. Uh, and you beautiful, awesome people and souls may also uh, claim some balls if they are there. And if you join me uh, out there on this expedition that is going to be epic as heck. All right, so I was ranting on. Oh, yes, we want to go back to, right? So there's that site. So I'm already super hyped about the Medicine Hat Badland Guardian site. Now, just south of the border from Medicine Hat, because Medicine Hat is uh, further south uh, towards Montana and the U.S. border uh, than where I live in Calgary, Alberta. Uh, you know, so it's like this is literally just south of the mega that site, these Montana megaliths. All right, so look at that. This is Russia. Look at the polygonal geopolymer work in Russia, and then the Tartarian architecture then built over it. So obviously, the geopolymer uh, polygonal pyramid builder megalith builders were a civilization that predated the tar whatever the tartarian uh system and society and uh technology were um grand risings everybody good day and welcome welcome everybody i uh, frankie new west reset gerald simon Taran. Joe, cool, Sarah. All right. Well, now that you're all here, I might as well email you all the links to join in and get your uh, five thoughts uh, on this, right? Uh, and look at this. This is another, this is one of the dolmens of uh, Montana. And these truly are uh, giant giant titan megaliths and it's exactly what i've seen and found myself around alberta and it's a corresponding um 
verification of my own thesis that I had put together and started to document the evidences of uh, over the last several years since, uh, you know, seeing it with my own eyes and with new eyes, uh, what really exists and what really we live amongst. And I just have to highlight here that I got the little guy back and my next stream, I will show you the pictures on it. And on this is Mount Yamaniska and behind it, uh, the guardians of the mountain, um, man, I got to come up with some sort of epic name for it. It's these like three, 400 foot uh, like carved guardians, you can see their faces, the shadows of the sun, you can mm -hmm. fully see them armed and everything. And then there's a couple more, uh, like that are about a hundred feet uh, in uh, height uh, up above them. And then these uh, carved staircase up this cliff mountain face, cliff face that goes up, the staircase ascends probably a couple hundred feet and then it splits into two uh, that uh, then go about another 100 to 150 feet each uh, in opposite uh, directions, thus still being about like 150, 200 feet uh, above the ground and then both uh, entering into perfect carved out caves into the cliff face mountain. Uh, all on here and that I'm going to be hiking there and doing a uh, drone trip uh, out there as well this year, but for further exploration, but first the documentation of its actual existence. Now, before I go on with the Montana Megalis, as I need to email out all the invites here, I'm going to play uh, another very special um video that i believe is legitimate and although there's only four minutes and 20 seconds no 21 uh i say 420 <clears throat> this is uh mystery history another great uh great uh channel uh two channels they do but uh of what is uh the original videos i saw when they first came out on uh the internet uh, they were about 20 to 30 minutes long. This is only four and four and a half minutes of the overall footage. Uh, I've actually seen about half an hour's worth of the overall real footage, and that's why I believe it to be real. And it's absolutely astounding the amount of treasures. Like you can't fake it. Like it's just, it's oh my god. Like it, it's insane. But uh, they claimed uh, in the live that it was um, my. Uh, Persian Iranian friend, I got him to translate and to verify that they were saying, uh, and then I have a brain fart of what they were saying. Oh, Gilgamesh, that they believed that it was uh, the tomb of Gilgamesh. Uh, although now I've heard others claim that it's other Nephilim or other uh, different gods and demigods of the past. Well, let me know what you think.
So it's showing a newspaper uh, headline. This part wasn't in the original, so I'm going to have to get my friend to check that out. Uh, I'm talking over it now as I'm rewatching it once with you where it's going to be muted and just me talking with my thoughts. Then I'm going to rewind it and uh, play it with their original sound as I go outside, disconnect my phone before the battery dies, email Frankie, uh, Simon, uh, Gerald, uh, uh, Joe, and anybody? Oh, of course, Sean and Sarah. The link to join, as well as uh, actually, um, it's the Luvian American. If you would like, I can also email you the link to join. Right, and look at all of this it's Egyptian, Sumerian, Babylonian, the same sort of stuff uh, that we see all across. And that body looks identical to all of the carvings of the Sumerian, Babylonian, Assyrian uh, demigod beings. But uh, the original 25, 30 minute video uh, actually shows them entering like the moments like they... Uh, are walking through the dark um, entrance and then getting into the actual chamber hosting the tomb and all of the riches, and it's absolutely nuts. And isn't it? And uh, it brings up the um, documentation of in that one Chinese pyramid uh, where they found the mummified ancient queen uh, I believe, like, in Mercury or something, and that they could, like, pinch her skin and it was still rubbery and everything. And, well, it looks essentially like uh, this is identical but in even better condition. And is this ancient, uh, all of this, like, golden artifacts and antiquitech jewelry actually preserving their energy state and keeping them, you know, in a... Um, suspended animation, essentially, uh, the golden state and golden ages, and that uh, is it kept private because um, humanity, parts of humanity are so corrupt and ignorant uh, that they might attack or try to destroy and uh, potentially uh, kill uh, these suspended animated uh, real gods and demigods of the past, right? Like, who freaking knows? Uh, but I'm going to play it one more time and send the emails out. <laughs>
All right, and all the links to the videos I'm playing tonight, or today, sorry, tonight, uh, this morning, today, depending where you are, I guess uh, if you're in Australia, Asia, New Zealand, it might be tonight. Uh, anywho, it is uh, definitely morning uh, here in Calgary, Alberta, 7.49 a.m., and uh, I am sending, emailing out the links. Uh, Simon, it's uh, been to you. Uh, sorry, I have three different emails, uh, some accessible on different things. My phone died right as I got to it, um, so it's just charging, and then I will send out the rest uh, to all of you beautiful souls. And in the meantime, I've got another quick uh, video for you, and right here, who wants their mind blown once and for all? undeniable perpetual motion machine easy toy anybody can 3d print it make it and then you just need a few mar magnets and metal marbles and you're ready to go Everybody, video here for you today. Thank you, Simon. Sorry about that. All right. 
Okay. Well, good thing I was muted because I was also close. Trying to clear my throat there. Um, but two of the emails now sent, but I do need to get to my third main one, which is on my phone. Uh, so it should be charged by now. Uh, so we have, and Gerald, uh, link has now been sent to you. Um, Sean to you, Simon to you. Uh, it's gotten out, but I still need to get to you. Frankie, sir, and Joe, and... Who else might, uh, there's many, but anyways, uh, I need to get onto that. So I've got another a short video lined up for all you beautiful souls and awesome beings joining in right now. And this caught my attention, Kincaid Mounds. Where else is, uh, Kincaid famous for? Oh, could it be... Uh, the Kincaid discovery of the Grand Canyon Pyramid Complex, uh, inner uh, tombs, mummies, and treasures. No, uh, yes, yes, that's exactly where the Kincaid name comes from. And that uh, the Smithsonian tried to claim that Kincaid was a fictional uh, character that never actually existed. So let's uh, shout out to Chuck once again. May his soul rest in peace and be watching all over all of us or eh, exploring all of these ancient sites that he did so well at bringing to us and documenting in his lifetime and left us a legacy of videos of. And once again, I have already put all of the links to each of the videos I've played in the video description uh, of the video of the YouTube and Facebook and all whatnot videos uh, that you can access them afterwards. So at any point, uh, I just wanted to point out though, each of these dots are ancient sites, mounds and whatnot that Chuck uh, <clears throat> has documented and explored. And for those who don't uh, know uh, who Chuck is, C-H- uh, apps oh my goodness cf dash apps 7865 uh was chuck's channel 115,000 subscribers he, he deserves all of that and millions more uh because he documented pretty much a million different ancient sites uh, across google earth and Google or Alphabet Corp or whatever the heck you are or Google's AI for the good of humanity. If you could please find a way to unlock or uh, upload accessible to the public uh, all of Chuck's uh, different sites that he mapped around the world, uh, it would be an absolutely huge service. Either way, uh, until that day comes, we will just have to watch each of his videos and, uh, you know, re-add them to an overall archive. And welcome, Sean Gerald. Good to have you both with us. Morning. Yo. Good mor morning. Good morning, do ya? I thought we'd get back to ancient America. I wasn't really planning on doing a video today, but didn't really have any plans and kind of getting on my brother's nerves. He told me to go in my room, and make a video. So I think I will. Let's go down to the Kincaid Mounds in Southern Illinois. I made a video on this place about three years ago, but all I've learned on ancient America, well, this place was very important. It was contemporary with Cahokia, but this is one of those places that is just kind of lost and lonely and just sitting out there. But here you can see the mounds at the site. This was a pretty impressive ancient city, as I said, around the same time as Cahokia. But there is no park here, no way to really visit the mounds except park on this road out here and overlook them from a distance. And that's kind of sad. Some of the cities in the area, there's a metropolis, really. Brook Park, High Point, Paducah, Farley, Ledbetter. Those are a few of the cities in this general area here. I'm wondering if any of my subs have ever been to this site. It appears to be fairly lonely and quiet. This is about 140 miles east of Cahokia. And obviously, when the Google Earth imagery was taken, there was a lot of flooding going down in this area. 
And maybe some of you who live in the area can tell me if this is an annual event, all this flooding out here. These mounds were excavated about 1934. And even on this mound today on Google Earth, you can even tell where the excavations took place. You can see how that mound right there was carved into right there. But it makes you wonder if they had flooding back then and how often it happened. But these mounds have obviously withstood many, many floods, and they still stand out there today. And just gives credit to the people who built them. These aren't just mounds of dirt, clay, gravel, other things. They were painted in some cases. Sometimes they had stairways. But when this is all, the better we can treat them. You wonder why the apathy towards ancient American history but that's why I make these videos, just let people know that there's places out there that exist. But this is the look from overhead at this ancient city, maybe a thousand years old, maybe started a little earlier than that. But here is a diagram of what this place used to look like, places where people lived, a big wall all the way around it, as many as nine mounds, and some of them pretty darn large. And even people who are curious about these ancient America sites, is this one place where people would actually stop. That's another reason why I make these videos, just so people have an idea of what they look like, and maybe they would stop at these. But would people tour these if this was an open park? But we can certainly let our mind wander what this place used to look like and what the people were doing who occupied this site. Here is another artist's rendition of what this place might have looked like. Now, I was looking for any news stories on the Kincaid Mounds, and I found this one from Heritage Daily. This came out a little earlier this year. The Kincaid Mounds, the Mound Metropolis of Illinois, says the Kincaid Mounds is an ancient tribal center of the Mississippi culture that built a large settlement comprising of raised mounds in the present-day state of Illinois near the banks of the Ohio River. The Mississippi culture was a Native American civilization that emerged around 800 A.D. in the Midwestern, Eastern, in southeastern regions of America, the civilization was composed of a series of urban settlements linked together by loose trading networks, with the most notable site being the city of Cahokia. So this place seemed to be linked to Cahokia through trade and other things. It says the area around the Kincaid's Mounds was first occupied during the Archaic period between 8,000 to 2,000 BC, where the region was probably inhabited by cultures of the early woodland. The founding of the Kincaid's Mound is determined to be about 800 A.D., although some sources suggest around 1050 A.D. But here are some pics on the ground at the Kincaid's Mounds, what they look like on the ground. Not much to be seen, just grass-covered mounds. Certainly looked entirely a lot different in antiquity. It says Kincaid likely served as a trade link between native settlements in the Cumberland, Tennessee River Valleys and the metropolis of Cahokia in which influences of the Cohogian culture is evident in the Kincaid shell tempered ceramics. Just reading a little more, it seems a few more mounds have been discovered here since I did the video three years ago and they said nine or 10 mounds existed. But just reading, it says the society revolved around a complex chiefdom structure led by a male chief and his family who exerted civil control over the community and priests who had religious authority, probably some shaman type figures. The major construction phase took place in what is known as the Kincaid Middle Component, and that is called the Classic Mississippian Period, in which 19 mound monuments were constructed with 11 being identified as substructure platform mounds, in addition to a large plaza situated near the nucleus of the settlement. The entire site was surrounded by a large palisade wall of upright logs or posts, with a series of guard houses or bastions at the intervals of about 100 feet. The palisade may have served as a defensive purpose, but it has also been suggested that it functioned to mark the boundary of the ceremonial site and the seat of the chieftain's authority. But that is the way it looks from overhead today, maybe remnants of that wall right there. This is the way artists think it looked a long time ago. Now, I will leave a few links below, but here is the visiting area at the mound site today where you can go and overlook these from a distance. There is another look at the mounds, but just finishing this one article, it says the Mississippi culture occupation at the site appears to have ended by 1400 to 1450, possibly due to the exhaustion of local resources, such as timber and game, a period which archeologists call the bacon quarter. There's other possibilities, I guess, maybe disease being introduced into the area is one other possibility, but 
by about 500 years ago, these people seem to be gone. Now, here is one story, and I read a few like this, prehistoric mound, disturbed, possibly looted. But if you don't have a park, you don't have security here, obviously we're going to have some problems like this. Can't we treat our ancient America history just a little bit better? That's all I'm asking. That is a quickie on the Kincaid Mounds here in southern Illinois, center of ancient chiefdom. This seemed to be a very important place about a thousand years ago in ancient America. Probably these people were trading with Cahokia and also places to the east. Ancient America was one big trade network based on the riverways. You have stuff in Florida from the Great Lakes region. You have stuff at mound sites in Indiana and Illinois from Wyoming. I mean, it's really remarkable how the goods were traded all over ancient America a thousand years ago, 2,000 years ago. It's a pretty amazing story, and I'm still looking into it. Thought I would talk about that one today. I don't think I made a video on ancient America in about three weeks. Some of these sites, I realize, are very important after all the videos I've made on this subject. Well, as I said with NEXT in our interview Friday night, some of these places in ancient America, and really ancient America itself, is kind of neglected as far as the importance in ancient history, but we have these pyramid mounds all over ancient America. Some of these sites are just kind of sitting out there lonely, just trying to make it not quite so. Hope you thought that was cool, and you all have a very nice day. And I'm back. There we go. Okay, and what did everybody think of that one? They're all over the world, all over our local sites in North America, South America, Europe, Asia, Africa, Antarctica, wherever you go. They are everywhere. Um, all right, so... We have Gerald, we have Sean. What are your guys' thoughts on uh, Megalith around your local, your local terrain, your local stomping grounds? Those stones coming out of the ground, they're called kettles. And uh, there's a place near where I live called Kettle Point, and it was, uh, that's where like all these kettles come out of the ground. And like it's all around the beach lines, and uh, they claim that there was only one other place in the world that did that, and that was uh, somewhere either in New Zealand or Australia. I didn't realize you got you guys had kettles up there too. Really? Yeah. That's fascinating. Yeah, and they have this. They have this weird, like they they all try to push their way up to the surface. It's a fascinating thing, and they're and they're spherical. And, I don't know, it just makes you wonder if they're more. <laughs> right? Like, they, they've got to be. I suspect a lot of it um, was, like, plasma catastrophe sort of, like, wiped it out or what destroyed it. Or you, maybe even it was an epoch after uh, they were wiped out, and then there was this some sort of mass plasma heat like event. Like a lot of the pretty much anything that is labeled badlands in North America is usually a national park or a no go zone, and that they all have these like uh, what are called fairy chimneys or uh, hoodoos, as well as mounds, pyramids, and then in the mountains, you have these megaliths, dolmens, and this is right here is another one of the polygonal geopolymer walls of Montana. And there's identical stuff across Siberia as well on the same uh, tightness scale. Oh, welcome, William. Greetings, everyone. A good day. Yeah, I'm here, man. Uh, 
I thought for sure someone was going to pop on. Right. Sorry about that. Um, I think he's still uh, – we're figuring out the sound and video. If B and Gerald, are you with us? Good, sir. Well. Why is this? You must be swirled away. I found a really good um, electroculture uh, guy that from Quebec, and he has his own YouTube channel. I don't know if you know about him. I think his name is – it starts with a Y. Oh, darn. I wish you could just find it right this second. Yes. I, I know exactly who you're talking about, but half of it is in French. Yeah, Yannick. Yeah, but he, uh, on his channel, he does – you, you yeah. sure some of this yeah, yeah, he's awesome yeah yeah like he's teaching how to like charge water back in the conversation sorry about that i just <laughs> stepped out really quick i just had to jump stir up his heart yeah you know and anyways, shout that's... out astra mindful exposures who i am just sending the email to as well as new west oh. recent uh I frank found somebody um, sorry Brian. <laughs> Sarah Mindful Exposures made this uh, masterpiece of a logo for Dutch, uh, Dutch Sense, and it's so epic. Uh, but he's having internet issues and connectivity. I sent it to him. I hope he gets it because I know he will love it and it shall lift his spirits. And shout out to Julia, Hallio. Halle Julia, uh, who is currently down um, as one of the hosts of Contact in the Desert right now. And she also does the Biomed Expo and the Alien event, which I am going to try to be a part of, uh, uh, as Rex is also there, as is Sam Osmanovich. And I got to get to Sam so that I can show him uh not that but uh, this right here the faram foundation because i have yet to ever hear him talk about see or know about uh the geoglyphology of his site and it's a whole nother verification of the bosnian pyramids being uh intelligent um constructed advanced pyramids and they are, in fact, built into the geoglyphology mapping system of these ancient megalithic pyramid builders. And Arthur, Arthur Faram, all on his own, shows that uh, the, both the walls, uh, the same lengths and measurements applied to his radial geoglyph uh, system, plots out uh, to the specific points of these ancient sites and that uh, he then discovered in Central America that there was this catastrophism sunk in uh, landmass because some geoglyphs uh, were located from the, the pyramid, uh, the initial pyramid, which he dates to at least uh, 30,000, or sorry, 24,000 years ago, due to the fact that uh, of when sites appear and disappear in the geoglyphology mapping and uh, building of all the other uh, corresponding sites around the world and the more recent updated uh, geoglyphs and that <clears throat> when you add in the uh, four cardinal points of the pyramid uh, you then get the bay of uh, Nazarenes, the southern border of Russia still today uh, is built into one of the cardinal points, uh, Gotland Island, and uh, down to Africa, site of many geoglyphs in Cape Town, uh, South Africa on it, and that uh, stage two, the moon and the earth pyramids, that also there angles and lengths of them and then he shows that it's damaged by something but uh add to even more specific spots like the another current border marker of russia and uh i guess ukraine there which you know they're having the war over uh, as well as directly to moscow also built into it jerusalem 
uh, Tunisia, North Tip of Africa, Tip of Portugal, and that then also when you add in uh, the triangulation of the three pyramids and how they were built, oh, welcome, Simon, that uh, that also adds another uh, six um, points and new spots as well to these specific spots, including the Strait of Gibraltar, uh, North Tip of Ireland, and Port Sad, Tunis, so many ridiculous places, I think. Yeah, huh. also uh, St. Petersburg or Kaliningrad, one of the other. No, the Kaliningrad adds there. So yeah, St. Petersburg there. Um, and yeah, it's just absolutely insane uh, how many specific geogra geographical um places of power and ancient uh, civilization cities and points are built into this mapping grid of these ancient pyramid sites and that it's undeniable evidence of highly advanced engineering and mapping of the overall world system and of the existence of these highly advanced uh, places and civilizations and points of um, civilization through, uh, you know, tens of thousands of years and into the pre-cataclysm prior ice age uh, timeline. And that uh, what the point being of these Moscow borders and these current borders of Russia built into that pyramid that uh, old Moscow city itself, a citadel city, a star city, a star fort city, uh, also has the geoglyphology built into the streets and the center square point being the radials out of those geoglyphs and that uh, the Moscow city geoglyphs actually map out uh, current Russian borders as well as some boundaries between Finland and Norway uh, and Sweden there. As, and then to top it all off, there was updated Bastion Fort, a.k.a. Star Fort um, forts built on top of the pyramids themselves and that these are called colonial era Bastion Forts, but in fact they also have the geo glyphology, uh, science, and mapping built into their archaeology and their lengths, their measurements, their walls, and all the positioning of them. And that's what this big center circle is, is where you're measuring out from. And that, uh, you know, it shows the most, more recent, last uh, civilization using and applying this same uh, hidden, suppressed, uh, worldwide mapping system, and that here is uh, another one of the bastion forts, the runes of it, uh, still being able to show the geoglyphs on top of the moon pyramid, and it as well showing a whole bunch of new uh, sites, but still the same sites, and that in both the old uh, pyramid walls as well as the newer bastion forts, it gives you this mapped territory right here, which is pretty much the current European Union state and also what, uh, you know, uh, Nazi uh, Germany was trying to uh, conquer at the height of World War II, as well as what, you know, they see Ukraine in it. And, you know, that uh, I guess the USSR had taken parts of that. And what is that? That's the old Tartarian Empire. And that's once again, Europe 30,000 years ago was a different territorial empire than Tartaria and the rest of the Middle East as well as Africa. And that they're still fighting for these same spots today. And this right here is one of the pyramid radials goes exactly to this Russian European border marking. And that looks ancient as heck, and it definitely is. And, well, that's pretty so, ancient as heck. 
just to highlight how difficult it is to align things over such long distances, just look at the U.S.-Canada border. Because hypothetically, it's supposed to be straight lines for a long bit of it, but uh, it really is not. And it's really easy. You can tell on Google Maps because they cut all the trees along this uh, border. And so there's this giant no-touching zone between the two countries. It's kind of amazing. You can right? see and like that and, and uh, I know it's and you know what all these connections we can't even do this fun. stuff today it's Shemistry yeah, the Shemister what up Shem Tartarian Truth oh yeah shoot I still have to finish sending out that email and I will also uh, send uh, invite to you good Shem can you hear me Join. yes yes we can Loud and awesome. clear. my mic's acting up so uh, I was just going to say all the connections between all these different ancient uh, sites they all come down to um kind of like an electroculture sense where they brought that electricity down from the stratosphere through pyramids or through star forts and they brought it and grounded it and it allowed all the plants to have that energy coming in and completing the circuit so it makes you wonder when they talk about the garden of eden was it the Garden of Eden or was it the Garden of the E Den? Just a thought. Yes, just like E Gypt was gypped out of the energy when they took the ark or Moses, you know, left with uh, yeah, well, the. Yeah, well, one of the arcs. I don't think it was the one that. It's I the did perfect some measurement on saying that it, a while back the, in a life. It's it that was, Hutchinson remade it and it like for it was the perfect fit for inside the king's chamber, supposedly. Absolutely. It was a arc, but there's no oh, arc, yes, arc. yes. But I'm saying yeah. like Egypt, like the pyramids, they got gypped, they were stolen of the energy that used to power it. Yeah, Moses or from what Sorry the for theory goes, is, is that Moses York, took it out of the pyramid den yeah. and the energy den. Yeah, it's an interesting thought by far. So I don't or know if it was the, the actual... density. What's that? You could say den as in density. Oh, the energy density. The e density. In the interesting. Or you could even break it up a little further and go guard n the e den. So you're guarding the e Now we're getting into the real etymology of it all. And I did send the invite to Paul Knight, uh, What the Flock TV. Shout out to him and anyone that uh, is uh, into etymology and the spell casting that spelling is when you write your spells and manifest it into uh, existence. You got to check out what the flock TV. So, what do you guys think about Eden being in Florida? Uh, I don't. I still don't really subscribe to that. I, I believe that it like it was like Eden everywhere essentially at one point, and that like the Atlantis was like everywhere sort of thing. At yeah, one point. it was a system. It Eden might, I, I would suspect if anything in Eden might be like an off planet or in planet or intra dimensional plane sort of thing as opposed to a Floridian spot per se. I've seen well, some very interesting architecture that's in Florida, but um, I don't know. I keep thinking to South America where everything is super overgrown. You know, and we oh, do and know that they have, have overgrown there. pyramid cities everywhere. And there. so, like, now they're using ground penetrating radar and flying over, and just like between the leaves of the trees, they get just enough data of what's down below there that they can see cities that are just completely covered. So, we should really be going out there you know, on expeditions and searching, you know, on our hands and feet, you know, looking for all these lost civilizations because. How much are we missing out on? Was wasn't there another place up in? Uh, I think it was the Himalayan mountain. No, was it the Himalayans? 
I can't remember where this place was. I'd have to look at my research, but they claimed to find Eden there. And it was a, a, a spot where nobody is allowed to go. And the two scientists that went there to study it had to uh, commission to the government for years before they actually opened it up for them to go. And when they went there, they found species of birds and plants that haven't been seen in over 2,000 years. It might even have been somewhere in Venezuela. I'm not sure. Like I said, I have to check the research. But it was very interesting because uh, there were lions that were there and they were lying down with animals that normally they'd eat. And it was a very interesting place. So I'll get back to you on where that was. But who really knows where it was? It's, it's well, I mean, definitely it's an interesting thought. If you go out into the middle of nowhere, like even here in Canada, if you go up north to where everything's on fire right now, you're going to find all sorts of animals that like we don't even know exist most likely. So uh, the people who are lighting fires, then you know who you are. You are monsters. Mm. Have you heard about... They should what? hang or like burn at the stake if anyone were to ever deserve it. Like just all yeah. the poor wildlife right. and like... Definitely animals. burn at they the stake. They should burn in that fire. Oh, like, Definitely. Oh, like, and, and if the penalties were, if you're caught lighting these fires to that you would be burnt at the stake, I guarantee a lot less people would intentionally start those fires or they'd at least think about it twice. Yeah, they light the fire, they go in that fire. Yep. Right? But like, have you guys, did you watch uh, Dutch Sense's... Uh, Yes, a uh, half hour long video on how Quebec started on fire basically all oh, within yeah. 60 seconds. Yeah, and do you know how fucking beautiful that entire area is? I've yeah, been up there, not, it is gorgeous. Not so anymore. burning it is a crime. See, now here's the thing was somebody burning it, or is it the actually North American craton that's shifting and right starting here. fires from below? Speak of the devil, eh? I already retweeted that on both my tweeters. Or on all three of my tweeters. Yeah, well, you know, I've heard of he does screwed. something on it too. I heard of like cases where like a safety chain like from a trailer would just drive along and create sparks and just create a huge fire all the way along. Yeah, but this was over... This was over a whole province, and the fires lit almost instantaneously over the whole line where the North American Craton is. And up there so, is basically all rivers and lakes. Like I, I'm talking entirely covered. You yep. you have never seen so many lakes in your life. Yeah, no doubt. Which makes me wonder: like, could somebody actually put together multiple groups of people in order to light these fires all at once? I, I'm <laughs> guessing that's the actual case. I, I honestly believe mm -hmm. so, especially the ones that started in northern Alberta. Uh, Those, I think, were started ago. by people. It yeah. all popped up, like, overnight, and it was, like, documented that they were – TikTok, it's all documented on TikTok. All the locals documented it, showed, like, that – like that they were actually like apprehended a couple of people and then they like didn't get charged or something and like the police somehow like yeah i don't know what the heck it was effed up and then all of the local people tried to like get their own machinery donate it and get it in to fight the fires and put it out the first two days before it spread and then the government and the police uh blocked them from doing it and tried uh, arresting the people that were trying to fight the fires and it was absolute insanity and you won't see that on the mainstream or uh the mainstream media you got to go over to the uh foreign uh eastern sponsored social media platforms to be able to actually see what's uh anything political so i'm not going to get into it any further here well i know right. about the alberta situation but this is different you know how many people would take to do that all at once you're talking yeah, hundreds. The government agents Military. If it's a government. yeah not with drones uh, no. what well, you guys yeah. haven't mentioned you haven't mentioned dew or do directed yeah. energy yeah. weapons yeah, yep. that's also if, you, if you look at what happened in California, they literally wiped out cars. Cars were melted. Houses were melted. And but the trees, trees around them are still standing. 
Yeah, I've seen that. There was lots of evidence of it. Yeah, so that, to me, I agree with Bernie. You know, this is like, this is governmental. This is all by design. Now, instead of uh, damming up rivers and burying cities under lakes, they're now going and burning down areas and regions and entire regions and with directed energy weapons yeah they could do a whole province all at once it wouldn't take an army it takes one person hitting a keyboard you got a good point this is all by design everything we've seen over the last three years has been by design you know and then Absolutely. and then they blew up the guide stones right which were showing the indicators of what was really going on they want our population down to 500 million by 2030 uh, my freemason contact said that was the beginning of the stopwatch that was the like um, the firing of the gun for the beginning of the race they're all in their positions and they're all now moving forward because the guide stones are destroyed it's right. it's a way of getting that message out eh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was like the mile marker. Here we go. So yep. do you think they fight over which game piece they get? Like, oh, I want the race car. Oh, no, you get the thimble. <laughs> <laughs> now nah, they're yeah, all loyal yeah. to the dog. <laughs> yeah, I don't I think they're in fighting. I think it's all one unified boys. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, yeah. Did you, ever, did you guys ever see that one news uh, video where they this police officer, he had his dash cam going, and then like, he caught someone with like a big ball of like uh, a, a paper towel that was on fire, and he was throwing it, like trying to start these fires. Uh, I like, saw I a case that was, of a Molotov. The gas can that got caught. No, 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 no. Like this was during the wildfires in like Europe, and like they caught, like the cop came up on the guy, and he saw his dash cam, and he had a ball of like paper towel that was on fire and he was throwing it. like wow, creating the fire that. Day, sister from down under like i thought that so like i honestly do believe that there could be some sort of destabilizing government such well, uh, you know and people i group. should point out the video we're watching there in dutch it. is he kind of point sure shows that uh they're all along this craton uh rim and whatnot so it could actually be like a geothermal um event that could be triggering the fires potentially as well it could as also well. be it's triggering triggering the geothermal like Earthquakes, like if there's like a shifting or something, like is, is is it like on a tectonic plate line? Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, it's on a huge yeah, tectonic it's... plate line. The whole so, so maybe the... maybe it's creating that energy friction. You know, like when they say they claim that like light and energy and lightning can come out of the ground. Yeah, right before of a Plasma. earthquake. Yeah, the, like maybe, it, earthquake? maybe that's going on there and then creating those fires. And maybe do is the thing that set off the whole craton moving. Who knows? Well, if it's that long of a stretch, you're kind of right. Maybe it is a natural phenomenon. It could be both, also. Like, because yeah. I've seen Either enough evidence way, of people it is doing a major arson. problem that. Like, there's documented arson on some of, like, on many of the cases and then possible lots yep. of it's natural too whatever the causes may be it is absolutely horrible because we haven't even reached it's still two and a half weeks three weeks to wait two and a half weeks from the summer solstice in the beginning of summer it's still spring june just started and half of uh, the continent is on fire and like it's smoky and hazy everywhere, hard breathing. The and cold half. Like, the, exactly. Like, days? wait till August. Like, and I, it's uh, scary. Pray for rain. We got to, we got to do the <coughs> rain dance and the rain, um, you know the resonant frequency of rain and just pump it into the clouds they they do cloud seeding in chemtrails well f that shit let's uh pump our own frequencies in and make it rain because we know that it actually works like right just don't do it in california they had plenty of rain well we should have them set up everywhere and right, anytime right. there's a drought 
just blast it up and make it rain. Literally, the that's real technology. <laughs> Taryn Earthling, do you have? Can you pull up the patent for that? I'm sure I've seen that in the Google Drive. Yeah, that first cloud seeding patent. You talking about? Like the one where it's like the World War One style of like blasting with like sound waves from the ground, like the vortex cannons that. Oh, sound I cannon. Don't even know. <laughs> I don't yeah, know it's like a sound be, cannon. Uh, okay, well, we will. G- yeah, I um, know if it's exists. Well, I can show you the space and- charge. Well, yeah, you've got the more advanced ways. There's a way we can. There's, There's a way we can move clouds around with satellites and uh, flying. Clouds. All right, we're talking about the average folk, not what the government's doing. We know what they're doing, though. No, yeah, yeah. we want to go out with Organite and uh, set up electroculture everywhere because the more we do electroculture gardens, the more we spread Organite everywhere, we can, con- you know, contradict what they're doing to us. I mean. Uh, was a uh electroculture um trying to think of his name anyway he, you know he was showing a area right above uh, his electroculture garden where the clouds were clear and all around that area there were clouds what? and they were yeah, obviously like, camel absolutely clouds. yep it's the same principles of pyramids right so uh, if we're creating an energy vortex ourselves, right, we can counteract what they're doing to us with the chems. Just saying. I agree 100%. I actually think that electroculture was one of the base principles that they used when they were a million percent. pulling that energy down. Part of the technology right. of the pyramids, for sure. And that you see all of these... Um, different floodplains around the different pyramids, as well as the ancient aqueducts as and um, uh, canal systems all throughout and around them. It's because that was a major part of it, was the electroculture, agriculture of it. Right. You look at the uh, Palace of Versailles and the gardens around there, you know, I have to agree with Campbell in his thought that uh, these were actually farms, right? Oh, yeah. Before, you like, know, the-, um, the different star forts, especially, like, and uh, in a couple episodes with Campbell, uh, the uh, Portuguese one, is it? The oh, I got to p- pull up the picture of it now. Uh, the specific one that's, like, quite elevated high up, yet it's, like... Mm. In the center of it, it's like the basic battery star star fort, bastion fort. But then it's like it's like got like six layers, and like it's all the way up, and like they're protruding out. Sorry, I know where to get the picture of it. Of course, share this tab instead because it also actually fits into geo uh, glyphology. Now that I think about it, and that's how all-encompassing this ancient geoglyphology is. Here we go, the Portugal one, uh, yeah. this guy, and that uh, I on this uh, particular one, you see all of these rows on along the. Um, oh, is there an actual one that loads up? No, frick. I need to get a larger picture of it, but that there's like a whole bunch of holes on several layers of the different, um, what would be canals and used to have water in them. And it looks like the perfect potting spots for uh, like uh, essentially hydroponics and it'd be electroculture hydroponics that they were essentially doing in these. And that I theorize that there'd be a water spring pump at the very center of the bastion fort that would then have the water coming up from an aquifer and then flood down and uh, like a waterfall down, I guess, each side, each uh, layer down, 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 cascading down. And that's how it kept the water flowing and fresh instead of stagnant in all of these corresponding canals and moats that are depicted and shown in all of these uh, star fort, star city, citadel spots. But specifically in this one, because it's so high up, and that uh, there's, oh, I got to get a better picture of it. Uh, I'm failing right now. 
Where is it? I shall find it. And well, also, you know, you've got a lot of uh, underground uh, rivers and stuff that are going under some of these cathedral sites, right, where they were using the, the sound, using the frequency to activate the waters. The, yeah, the cathedrals, as well as the pyramids, as well as the star cities and star forts. So all right, under the Bosnian like pyramid. Yeah, ex right, exactly. The Bosnian pyramid, specifically all the work of Sam Zvonovic and their team there excavating it and showing all of the different uh, water systems through there, the undisturbed, uh, perfect, tranquil waters, as well as there's still one active stream at a lower la level flowing through uh, the very basement of the pyramid. Uh, but th it's documented that there were all of these fountains and actual aquifers built into the engineering of these uh, star cities and bastion forts and pyramids, and that uh, it, it proves that how advanced the engineering was while simultaneously that it had to be built literally from below the ground up in these macro formed megalithic geopolymer structures or or it was ground level and then it got covered by the mud flood you know think of that as they were building up they were actually at the real ground level during that period of time and then they built up and then did this geoforming but it was also to move the water that was coming in from the flooding right some of it some of these forts were actually ways where they were escaping the water that was coming in Depends For on sure, the period right? yeah. Especially like in South America, for instance, and in uh, Asia as mm -hmm. well. Yeah, I remember hearing like, uh, the, well, one guy's claim was like a comet came flying in and smoked the South Pole and then at the North Pole and blew all the water out and into space and then it came raining down and flash froze everything. Yeah, I heard something similar where a comet came and hit the Greenland ice sheet. And uh, that's what In caused Northern many Korea ice age. Well, supposedly. Right. Well, basically, all of Canada was covered in an ocean's worth of ice. So right. anything striking here would be a very bad day for anything everywhere. <laughs> Right. Yeah, that, that's supposedly what happened to end the Young Gadryas event. Uh, Randall Carlson, Graham Hancock have done some great work on proving that. And that when it melted the ice sheet, that's what would have formed the scablands and all of it rushing, uh, melting into the oceans, rising the oceans by 400 feet in uh, what they now have determined to be less than four years. The mega tsunami alone would have just destroyed everything, even without oh, an oceanic right? rise after. And, and to top it off, that mega ocean tsunami, and it shows throughout like Africa, through the Sahara, and through like Australia, pretty much all, and the Salt Lakes of like Ohio, Utah, and whatnot. All everywhere where there's these deserts, there's also the salt lakes and the salt scarred lands because the salted sir or the salted earth can't grow crops because it has salt in it, it's saturated with salt, no longer fresh water for the plants' crops to grow. That's why they've turned into such deserts. And if you ever noticed, underneath like a lot of the freshwater lakes and stuff, is a giant salt bed, mm -hmm. right? Where they had right. salt mining, and then of course they got flooded in. And I don't think that's really permitted as much anymore. <laughs> the fertile <laughs> areas in Canada, the reason they're fertile is because there's a whole bunch of fish and stuff that lived there, and then they became soil. Right. That's what uh, the San Joaquin Valley in Central California. That's why it's been such a breadbasket okay. for the world, right? Uh, you know, all the raisins and grapes. Sorry, everybody. I did not realize that we had Shem, Sarah, and Frankie, New West Reset, uh, hey, all waiting there, sitting. Sorry, everyone. And I... What's going on? Tartarian Truth. And I finally have the picture, this right here. 
of the one in Portugal and that you can yeah. see all of these whole spots like if water was coming from the center then cascades down each of these engravings could have had water wheels that were machine powered then it goes down again you would have had more water wheels that were machine powered then cascading down again with more and then all of your agriculture uh aeroponic or hydroponic uh planting along that is well, potentially oops bernie potentially earlier what that could be Bernie, earlier you guys were talking about, uh, you know, the pyramids and so on and the water tables underneath. And uh, in our community's research, we've also discovered that a lot of the ancient cathedrals, European or otherwise, have springs or wells or water underneath them. Uh, so it would make sense that whether it's a cathedral built on top of a quote unquote mountain or mound, or buried ancient structure, or whether it's a pyramid itself with the water underneath, this could account for the water being brought up from those lower levels and then sort of pumped throughout these facilities, star forts, pyramids, ancient mounds, cathedrals, whatever the case may be. And all, right. the all those holes, all those holes around the uh, star fort in Portugal, those actually could have been gathering the water and pumping it back up to the center. Well, right. another, another technology that uh, could be a possibility for the past is the atmospheric water generating machines. There's a guy named Moses West right now who I'm shocked mm -hmm. it's even legal for him to do this, but he's created a, a machine that collects stuff from the atmosphere and creates water for people all around the world that need it. But this technology, what? yeah, it's crazy. His name is Moses he's West. The forest fires, Shem. So you're going to be a water farmer on Tatooine? <laughs> but basically, uh, this technology that he's working with allegedly goes back to the time of the Incas. So it's possible that even back in, in history, these people were collecting whatever from the atmosphere to generate water and store it in certain places. Well, he's isn't potato um, originally from mountainsides in terms of agriculture? I'm not sure. But I think they, yeah, I think so, because they, they sent it over to... Uh, Ireland because it was so easy for it to grow and they were having that famine. So I think it came from maybe the Americas. I don't remember. It's been a while since I've looked into that. But one time I did because randomly I came across it when I was reading something. But let me find yeah, that. I've heard that. Real quick. I've heard that no, I the potato and the sweet potato are supposed new world uh, food, food stuffs, if you will. I've heard that as well. Yeah. The, well, I mean, aren't there uh, sweet potatoes like all across the rim of the Pacific? Like Japan has its own varieties and stuff. So I don't know. So a comment we, here from not sure says maybe they were structuring the water, and I absolutely agree. That's what they were doing. They were structuring the water. Yeah, would be a frequency. They would call it holy because you know mm -hmm. if it's good for you, then you know simple human terms. So it's holy. Oh, yeah, that goes back to what Bernie was saying about if the water runs down steps and so forth, it creates uh, One the rippling effect of the water. And I yeah. want to test uh, the water, creates, uh, structured water in cathedrals with the organs, especially. Right. Yeah. If yeah. That's uh, would truly make the holy water of their communions and whatnot. Yeah, it creates a frequency which then. Support, you know, the it makes it true, clear, and water. And clean water. Yeah, sure. Well, and as Dude, we've seen with really electroculture, you know, it's uh, these the plants are they the growth cycle is faster, they're healthier, right? So, if you're feeding structured water to your garden to your agriculture, then obviously, there you're going to have a better growth cycle, quicker growth cycle, larger plants, right? Yeah, and plants that are exposed to certain frequencies or pleasant music or even the pleasant tone of your voice there's something to be said for speaking uh quote unquote lovingly to plants uh, mm -hmm. they do tend to grow faster yeah, the and larger Masanodo, uh right. Effect, right of uh memory and water and uh so frankie new west reset shem tartarian truth uh antediluvian 
American and Mindful Exposures Sera. Uh, all of you can uh, do the same as uh, Gerald is doing, if you so wish. Or, or maybe some of you are actually on top of Gerald's restreaming to your own channels by hitting share with your audience. Yeah, I'm restreaming right now on both my channels. Excellent, yeah, I'm, right? I'm only That's hopping on for a second, but I got I to gotta get back to editing a video. I just want to say what's up since you invited me. But yeah, this is the machine right Fair here. Enough, you, you can see here it's pretty big, but he generated this water that's coming out of here from the atmosphere apparently. And he basically just goes around the world providing water for people in need. I don't know why they didn't do this in Michigan for the longest time, but I think they are now. Does he say how that it works? That was amazing. Or, or, Can you please uh, is, also post the link in the private chat, brother? I'm yeah, this is just his website. That. That's uh, amazing. Yeah. Yeah, you can do guys, I'm, like, I'm shocked. He's, I'm shocked he's still alive. He hasn't been assassinated or anything yet. So there, maybe there's something else going on with it. Who knows? But regardless, yeah, so, though, uh, by West. bringing awareness to all of these inventors and in all of these ways, it's a good way to help uh, encourage and ensure their survival. And that if this is a practical way to actually harness or access atmospheric. Well, I just uh, want to make sure it's not just like a Petitier device because that would be kind of. It's a I what device? Petitier device is what you use in a, an AC unit. Yeah, like a dehumidifier, just a giant it's, dehumidifier. An yeah. Atmospheric water generator. Because, so. like, uh, it, it, if it's just like grabbing the. Uh, the moisture that's in the air that's one thing but if it's yeah, pulling it down or something from that's the different. atmosphere yeah like yeah, atmosphere if, if it's pulling it towards the device that's that's completely different all right let's oh, check, yeah, let's check out like what it's real quick this is what it's called a device that extracts water from human ambient air producing portable water or water vapor oh yeah see so it's yeah. from the air not the atmosphere so the problem would this, be if in this the doesn't fire appear to be the same situation for Sorry. fighting fires it wouldn't be practical, but like in the nighttime, it would probably harvest the dew every night and whatnot. So like it would provide good drinking water, a hundred percent. I don't think this is the same thing though, because it's, it doesn't mention Moses West at all in this Wikipedia ar article. So it yeah, we'll, we'll different. have to look. I'll have to, yeah, I'll have to get back to you with that. But uh, so, thank you. Regardless, for all of these technologies should be being looked at and anything that is able to be easily or cheaply uh, replicated and utilized uh, should start to be doing so everywhere as you never know you can never have enough accessible clean uh drinking water and water in general right and especially yeah. if you can set them up in remote locations and if it's connect collecting just from the ambient air uh, around each night, it would definitely like fill up through the dew, regardless of hot, uh, dry days. Yeah, the only issue with the Petit device is that it's not very energy efficient. So, uh, unless we have uh, I've, free energy, I've got yeah, another yeah, one looked up. Free energy that is fine, and but. You know. Simon, I've got uh, the link Shem shared, and it's a little different than uh, what you've got in mind, my friend. Yeah, well, I'll have to look into this more and maybe find like a patent for it or something and see if he describes how he does it. So I don't, I can't find anything on this website. It's barely loading. My computer is awful when I'm streaming. It barely functions. But it's, yeah, just he calls them hydro panels, and it uses the power of the sun. So. It, Okay, so it's got built-in solar panel into the fan water cooling collector system, and it actually uh, it operates during the day and collects the water during the day and night through the energy it collects through the solar panels. So is it like a thermoacoustic resonator or something? Uh, it is solar panels combined with... Um, Hydro, what he calls hydro panels. Here, I'll pull it up. Uh, oh, because I, I was looking at it. I, I haven't read um, all the. Oh, you opened it up. It. Too. Uh, obviously, he shared it in the back. So you opened up the same one. I'll see if I can find the pattern for it too, real quick before I get off here, too. And uh, Shem, I do offer 
Uh, even though you are going, we are going to just keep it to pyramids and such if you want it to be live to get uh, build up your get you to that 4,000 hours again, uh, rebuilding your channel if you'd like and can shill uh, some people your way. And Frankie, New West Reset as well, uh, recently reaching that 1K. Congratulations, my fellow Calgarian, Tartarian, Targaryen. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was uh, pretty stoked about it. And I've arranged a, a meetup for uh, this coming Sunday, June the 11th at uh, one in the afternoon meeting up on Stephen Avenue, historic Stephen Avenue downtown. And we're going to do Hell a mud, yeah. mud flood walking there. tour. Yeah, nice. looking forward to it. It's going to be great. That's really just an excuse to meet up with people and uh, do the mud flood walking tour. And we're going to start on uh, 8th Avenue and 6th Street Southwest, and we're going to end at City Hall downtown, the old City Hall, which is an amazing building, by the yes, way. Yes, it is. And... Um, Shem, before sorry, cut you off, Frankie. Shem, before you go, and Frankie, uh, being in Calgary, Alberta, with me, this in Montana here, uh, this clearly megalithic polygonal geopolymer walls, where you can see it's the exact same as everywhere else, uh, that has them around the world. This also is in Montana as well these giant megalithic geopolymer uh wall blocks uh this guy right here part of the montana <clears throat> megalith you know i wouldn't be surprised if there's some of that in the badlands in southern alberta where you're headed around oh i've already i've i've been seeing them for years <clears throat> i know several sites where they are because uh, you know that uh, that area down long. there used to be part of uh, the Louisiana territories prior to the Louisiana Purchase in 1803. And then, you know, coincidentally, just a few months after that, you had the Lewis and Clark expeditions in the U.S. and you had the David Thompson expeditions here in Canada, exploring that whole region. Sucks. Right? And so... Frankie, uh, do you know, like, uh, when you're heading on the number one west uh, towards Canmore and Banff and whatnot, uh, which mountain Mount Yamaniska is? It's yeah, like Mount Yamaniska is the big cliff face one, right? Yeah. That giant, huge cliff one. Yeah. So, uh, um, from behind, when you climb it, and on the opposing side, going into the mountain uh, valley and the next peak on the opposite side of the valley and then it's like the chain of mountains all the way through the rockies going westward from there uh yeah. but that opposing peak i've got pictures that i'll be uploading and it's another spot i'm going to be going it appears to have uh two four to five hundred foot carved guardians and then uh, behind, but kind of placed like next to them, uh, another three or four hundred to two hundred foot carved guardians. And behind that, uh, this two hundred foot carved uh, staircase uh, into this cliff, up this cliff, and then uh, two hundred feet up on this cliff face, it then separates going. Uh, in both directions along the face of the cliff for like another 100, 150 uh, feet carved in completely to this cliff face uh, mountain wall and then enters to uh, complete rectangular entrance caves into the mountain. I've heard that there are structures or monolithic stoneworks on that uh, I guess it's the north slope, not the cliff face side of Mount Yamaneska. But I've never seen anything. Uh, I've heard it on your channel and I've heard it from, I can't remember where else, a couple of other sources. But it's funny you say that. In, when I was in grade seven, which would have been 1983, um, we did a school trip there and we hiked up the backside of Mount Yamaneska to the top. But they didn't take us to where any of those old monolithic ruins are of course <laughs> yeah oh sorry Shem, i'll let you speak oh no that's fine that was interesting what you guys are talking about so there's there's the main uh entrance going up to like the very top of it 
and then right when you're about two thirds away up the mountain, and when you begin that final like ascent from like the tree line up to the peak sort of thing. Yeah, I've actually also got pictures. Um, so there's a little pathway that um, will take you like around the side face the opposite side face of Mount Yamaniska facing the opposite mountain there in that valley that I was talking about and that's where it gives you this perfect lookout view of it all and then <clears throat> all of the rocks <clears throat> in that area look like giant megalithic built blocks it's absolutely crazy they look like stacked giant bricks it's <clears throat> insane I've got pictures of it all and there's like these little pathways through them that <clears throat> intersect at like perfect right angles through them and what look like they have these uh, petroglyph and runic in carvings on them. Uh, and all of that, uh, I do have pictures of on this little guy right here. That's which incredible. I yeah. Just I'd got love to see that removed like i tried putting it into my computer and it was in the wrong slot and it was jammed and i was worried i was going to destroy it but <clears throat> shout out to pops my dad was able to uh recover it so next nice. step getting it back into the card that actually fits and for some of the same strange reason the card that fit it into the camera when I got it back out of the computer, it won't even fit back into the other card now. And it's just a giant pain in the ass. So it's coming. I promise all of these pictures of what I'm talking about. Oh, you got it loaded. Out of boy. Okay. <clears throat> right. Yeah. I'm just checking them out. I never heard of this before. Okay. So stop, stop, stop. Uh, the picture of that someone standing in the middle there. This one right here to the right. To the right, yeah. If you can open that up. Looks like it's kind of small. So that is the area I was referring to of one of the paths and where the person's actually taking the picture from is uh, right where all of the crazy megalithic blocks are as well as the runes. And you can see at the very top uh, left corner of the picture, a straight line there. And it's like on top of that is like the next big giant megalithic block. Um, if you can keep going through those. Oh, and okay. Sorry. The picture right there to the left, immediately to the left in between the larger and that same picture. Um, Down the in the, with the writing all over it. Yes, you got it. um yeah, i don't know why these are so okay big. so in the very far ground you can see a bunch of lined big <laughs> standing so what look like monoliths those are the uh guardians that i speak of yeah i've never right. seen these that's amazing yeah that's well, amazing. I know there's about three different <laughs> hiking trails to take you up to the top <laughs> Uh, in that part, so yeah, up behind them that. goes the gravel. Maybe it's better quality yeah. here. So that's not Yamaniska. Yeah, this this one. There we go. Ah, uh, can it zoom in? I can probably zoom in with the. When I open them in a different time. Oh, yeah, we lost it. My computer is not the best for this. <laughs> I'm trying. Uh, so, oh, you're oh, doing there great. Is. There we go. <sighs> so right on the far bit. left of that picture, top corner, far left. Jeez. <clears throat> yeah, every time I zoom out, it does some crazy stuff. Sorry. No worries. Doesn't want us to see. There we there go. Much. That's the one. So um, the top left corner there of uh that mountain in the background is where right on the edge is where those guys are and you can't really see it it's cut off the carving of the pathway into that big old cliff there 
It looks huge. Oh, so stoked for just remembering it. I got to get out there. Yeah, that's basically a day hike to go up to the top and back down again. It, yeah, it is, right? We we did the day hike to get up to the top there of Yamanisco. Oh my gosh. But it's probably... It, you probably have to backpack in for a second day though to go into that uh valley and then go up and exploring into those caves there yeah that would be a two or three day yeah that i don't know if i'd be if i'd do the chain part it's pretty intense well it's funny how that some of the different paths what they've done is they've categorized them into expertise levels right to try to i think dissuade some people from exploring and messing around up in there. Oh, exactly, right? I wish the stupid menu like, would stop popping up. They'll dissuade you from going into the Grand Canyon with the uh, Apache helicopter, apparently. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Did you hear about how? Oh, the of course, around really these parts, on... a Chinook helicopter. Sorry. Sorry. Go ahead. Did you guys hear about how? No, it's all good. Did you guys hear about how the drones are automatically programmed in the software that they have to not be able to fr fly in a certain areas all the no fly zone so Apparently. naturally now you can't even have your drone go into the grand canyon because it's a no fly zone. by law it's, wow. it's insane it's law, stupid now. though what it's, it's oh my ridiculous. goodness it shouldn't be a law it, it covers, who, like, who do they think they are i think it covers airports and military or like government facilities in general uh, so I they guess they're counting national parks. Like that. Yeah, oh, yeah that I don't be... think they care yeah, about yeah. any of your rights. Yeah, that would be national parks, airports, yeah, yeah, all that kind of don't. stuff. State parks. All right, so yeah, yeah, before I hop off here, I did find these patents. It looks like there is one for refrigeration that he did, but there's also two for atmospheric water generation, so I'm not sure. I sent the link in the private chat if anyone wants to look into it and or post it on YouTube for anyone to look into. But yeah, overall, I mean, I don't know much about the guy. He could be a part of something ridiculous, but it seems like he's genuinely just trying to help people get water. So hopefully this oh, technology absolutely. becomes widespread and nothing bad happens to him. So, yeah, it right? seems pretty legit. All right, well. Oh, one it. last thing appreciate, before appreciate you go, Shem, just to finish it off. Uh, shout out to Hallie Julia, and I'm bringing it up because Julia got a picture of, I believe she, this is, she says ISIS temple. I actually think it's Shiva temple uh, when flying from Vegas or over Vegas uh, of the Grand Canyon here. And I don't know if it's large enough for all to see because it's on Instagram. It won't let me enlarge it, but. Uh, in this actual picture, you can see what looks like a sphinx face right on the top there of uh, the center of this pyramid. And then what looks like two paws going down. And is that the sphinx of the Grand Canyon? And I believe that is, um, she says Isis, uh, I <coughs> sorry, Shiva Temple, Shiva Temple. Could be a different one. Yeah, it's, I'm, it's pretty cool. But it's like there's 50 of those in there, and that's what they're not letting us see. And one of them is also called Solomon's Temple. I bet that is the real Solomon's Temple. And now we will let you go, Shem. Thank you for stopping in, brother. Much love. Thanks for having me. Have a good day, everyone. Take care, Shem. See ya. We have uh, a set up, a mindful exposure back with us and Frankie New West reset. Howdy, howdy. Um, so you're doing an 11th meetup downtown at uh, the historic um, Stephen Avenue. Stephen Ave, sorry. Jeez. Yep. Stephen Ave. And then, so I'm going to have to make it. I guess the week after that or two weeks after that medicine hat badlands and you're going to have to come down. Uh, oh yeah. That one. Oh, absolutely. Oh, for sure. There, buddy. Eh? You know, I'm going to oh, be. Sure, eh? We'll go stomping that, around buddy. this place together. Eh? Go out for yeah. a rip, eh? Go up just going to rip it up down there, bud. Find some balls, eh? Is this what you're talking about? Kettles or is kettle something different? Which oh, formation those are kettles. Is kettles? 
Those are like these are cows. cows. Yeah, stone cows. Okay, crazy. I've seen pictures of them in like uh, Siberia, Antarctic uh, beaches, um, Northwest Territory, supposedly the Bosnian pyramids, uh, Nan Mandol, supposedly also. Uh, I believe Easter Island and Hawaii also have them. I think somewhere in Asia too. Uh, yes. Cambodia, Laos, yep. uh, uh, someplace yep. like that, Vietnam or something. I, I can't remember. Exactly. All of the but above, in that sort of area. Yeah. I think every place you just listed also <laughs> has. Probably. Them. Yeah. I mean, the borders are you know arbitrary, really, right? Right, but it's like they tried to claim they're only in two different places. Well, they just give them different names, and uh, there you go. Well, those aren't kettles. Those are blah, 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 whatever, right? Uh, uh, lava bobules or whatever. <laughs> it is insane. Um, Asra, are you with us? Are you, are you Yeah, I was actually oh. trying to pull up some of the research I've been doing. Um, I know I talk about Oregon all the time because I obviously live here in a sort of obsessed. Oh, exactly. But. You're our Oregon's plug. You're the plug right. of Oregon, dear. Give I, us I literally live in Sweetland too. So. History <laughs> Titan Mountains of Oregon. Well, I think like for you were talking I, before I disappeared about just uh, Megalis and one of the things in Oregon that I, I keep talking about too that um, I was going to pull up a picture of but are the haystack rocks off the coast that have like that the facial features on it remember we kind of we did that show together and so oh, yeah. um but there's a lot of petroglyphs there's people have been finding them um on the lost coast of california i you know kind of not like tried to go find it i didn't have enough time to truly search because there's a lot of there's actually a pretty good sized chunk of remote area but um one guy's reported to have found some um on the cliff sides and then, you know, Oregon, like we've talked about, has it was considered the first or the oldest known human settlement until I can't remember what. Um, maybe it was in Arizona or somewhere in the southwest where they found an older settlement, but we had the oldest known petroglyphs and like signs of human civilization dating back, I think, 14,000 years ago. And we had the Paisley Caves. And I have, they don't give you these locations, but I have gone through Google Maps and I have found where these are. So, um, in some of these places, I've been really close to these areas. So, I'm planning trips this summer. And some of these areas, I got to go like later fall because it gets too hot because um, it's high desert. But these are remote, remote areas. Like, nobody lives out here. Um, so, there's, it's really fun on top of looking for this stuff because you're in the middle of nowhere by yourself. Um, I'll pop up some stuff if you want me to. I was just trying to find the folder that I specified for this specifically. So, Rod, you were it. saying you were in uh, Oregon. Is that correct? Yeah. Sorry, my computer was freezing. Yes, please do bring. Uh, open it up. Open it up. Yeah, here, let me just start with like some of the articles I've been saving. Okay. And so you can see like all the sites. Oh, and there's a cave that I found out um that's not too far away from me actually that i can easily do in a day trip so oh yes simon <laughs> actually that's something i i carry other tools with me because i do go by myself a lot like oh bernie i had a bear encounter after our uh after our live the other day and that's my second bear encounter in a couple of years synchronicity the bear Yikes. brought you a bear Right? <laughs> it was a good bear. It wasn't a harmful bear. No, it wasn't. And actually what I, um, to be honest, I've never seen a, a wolverine in the wild. And my mind went there at first. Like it would have been a really big one. <laughs> but 
but it wasn't a whole thing there. There. It, was a, it was a bigger yearling so it was really furry and it threw me off at first because it looked like it had a really furry tail and then i realized later it was like They're it was scruffy at that age right yeah yep Oh yeah. my goodness. I usually try to feed them at that. And when they're like that, my girlfriends are like, I say girlfriends because it's like, there's my current Amber. And then before that, my ex and like my ex before that. And like the 20 years that I drive through the Rocky mountains, every time I'd see one, I'd go out and try to feed it. And they're like, what the fuck are you doing? It's like, it's a cute bear. Well, I have a, I have a little video. I'll show you. We won't play the audio because I'm talking to this, uh, forest service guy who ended up helping me, but I found a yearling like a year ago and I thought it was a cub because it was so malnourished. Um, and I totally, it was like, I, w I was on the, with the fish and wildlife. I, <laughs> I was, and I, they were worried I was going to try to save it or something. I think they just like thought that I was, <laughs> I didn't, I didn't, it I had would. huge paws, but I'll show you a little video I made of it. I just have to pull it up really quick. Sorry. I, I labeled it Little Ben when I sent it Aww. to them. And so I think that's why they thought I was Because <laughs> they, like, called me. They're like, Sarah, we know you're really worried about this, but please don't try to save this thing. Here. I want to save the problem. The bear. Are Here, I'll show you. Me? Do you know how loyal a big bear is that you've raised from a baby bear? That's oh. your baby bear forever, you know? Like, like that Polish military one? that bear right. Uh, you Wojtek, don't whip it, but you the it bear. Good. Here we go. This is my little bear experience. See how little he is? When I get up to him, you'll see how big his claws in. But I'm like, there's so there's I, there's nothing you can do when you you're not really supposed to because mom could have still been around. Like he could have oh, yeah, still. Oh yeah, you're been. crazy. Why were you trying? Like that bear was hiding from you, climbing a tree. It's oh, oh you, you, okay. You tree. don't know the series of events. I this Sorry, I waited. Like, there's something the wrong with the bear. My bad. I should let <laughs> yes. you tell your story. And before and I, I do, I, I would just like to state. I am not actually condoning people kidnap baby cub bears yes. and try to raise them for themselves. Nor should you do what I'm doing right here. You should yeah, not. This isn't. Uh, it, this isn't. As you close as I do. Here. You'll see how close I get. But this was after that's I had already. Cub. That's it. not adolescence. That's still cub, I think. No, I know, but wait till you see its claws. Oh my god, you're so close. That mom would have freaking torn you apart. Too. I was already. I had already cleared the area. I had already been in the area for a while before I did this. I went down the hip back the hill. I was trying to find somebody to help. I found a forest service guy. He came back up. To, and so the, the two of us are standing here at this point. He was way more bold. Look at how big these claws are when I get up on it. You can see. Oh, that was it. It's kind of dark, but he had big claws. And so I sent the video to... Fish and wildlife, and okay, the guy so you like, had a forest ranger with you when you were filming that. He wasn't a forest ranger, sorry, he's a forest service worker. Oh, There's a different person with you, though. You were not alone yes. with that. Yes. You had to, yeah. oh, like, okay. I have a video of him approaching this thing. He got way, he got way up closer than I even did. It just looks like I was super close. I, you guys, I was very there's okay. So, before I even went and got him. I was yelling like, hey, bear, hey, bear, thinking mom's around. I was, I surveyed the whole area. I do keep spray and on me. Alone, very, you, okay, very, very good, very spray. good. I probably uh, need to get something else. So anyway, you'll, I'll show you guys more stuff. Get at least a 10 millimeter. Okay, least. and here's the thing. This is so ridiculous. My ex actually very American hunted, and my, my brother does, but I have still yet to actually ever shoot one. And so I need to do that. And then I definitely have, because I've been starting to go, I go on back forest roads all the time by myself. I go find hikes all the time by myself now. And I am realizing I have to, there's some crazy people out there. Yeah, <laughs> there's no, a lot uh... of Years. It's not just the bears and the moose. If you're far enough north for that, that uh, yeah, no, the two-legged yeah. animals are just as scary. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. I was gonna say yes. The Sasquatch, they will take you. And so when oh, you hear I have a Sasquatch, Sasquatch story. Stay <laughs> with you for life, and you get the shivers every time you freaking remember. <laughs> Um, 
I have a Sasquatch story that I had confirmed because I went through a period where I was listening to the Chronicles of Sa- or the Sasquatch Chronicles. If you guys have ever listened to those, they're really good actually. But they people have recorded a lot of audio of Sasquatch, and I had an experience with my ex. We were out rock hounding in an area I found out where they did like they've done a show, one of those Bigfoot hunting. They did a show in that area. And uh, we were completely by ourselves. We were, we were like traversing through these back. They're not really even gravel roads. They're sort of like grown over with pine needles and stuff. So they're not even like roads really anymore. It's pretty off-roading. So we were like going back through all these crazy areas and nobody was out there. It was probably like early spring. Um, literally, we didn't run into a single other person. And then we ended up camping at this campsite. And I've been trying to figure out exactly which one I was at, but we had a herd of coyotes come through and then I had the weirdest sounding. It set chills down my spine. It was super close. It was really loud. And the closest thing I can compare it to now that I've listened to that show and listened to their audio was the gibberish talk from the Sierra Nevada sounds. It sounded like some large, crazy beast type creature talking in gibberish. I know I probably sound crazy right now. And the funniest thing is there's a lot of wild horses around there. There's not actually, there's not really supposed to be any wild burrows as far as I know. But after this thing made all these really weird sounds, really loud, louder than I would ever think a wild horse could. And I went back and listened to wild horse noises because I was really curious. Anyway, it made a donkey hee-haw. It was like talking in this like that. And then it was like, hee-haw. <laughs> And it made us laugh because we were just like, what the hell? But the craziest thing was this like herd of coyotes that came through right in connection with this. And it was like, we could hear them. It was, it was insane. It was like, it had to at least be 20 to 30. And then, um, and I guess this all connects. So that's my Oregon Sasquatch story for you guys. (laughs) The coyotes fleeing could have been a sign that, uh, you know, the Sasquatch was in the immediate vicinity and the uh, coyotes, as you know, get spooked really easily, even if they are in larger groups. Yeah. Just take off. Right. So maybe that's why they were yipping and scattering all over the place and probably scatting too, literally shooting. I think you say it imitated like a donkey afterwards though. And I do believe they probably would have this like higher pitched different like you're saying gibberish but to them probably fully functional language well and that was what was so weird it was so different that with this gibberish talk was actually really low it was very guttural and it was almost like there was little uh, roars and were like the low, okay and that it, low travels like miles or kilometers through yeah the base and ground just like elephants uh they found communicate yeah. in yeah. herds through that low Trees base. communicate wow. through the ground that way, you know, like for miles they found out. So, yeah. Well, and the yeah. other thing is Oregon, much like Alberta, is a horse ranch country. A lot of horse ranches around there. And um, from my experience, a lot of horse ranchers will keep a few donkeys in the herd because donkeys are super aggressive and will chase off coyotes, wolves, and sometimes even bears uh, to protect the horses. So perhaps the mimicry of, you know, what we're talking about that could be a Sasquatch, perhaps intelligent enough to mimic sounds of other animals that they're hearing out in these wooded areas, such as donkeys, horses, cattle. Right, well, it was probably speaking in its language, and then it, ended with like an imitating of another animal as if to almost mask its presence or its speaking and like you said that like it made you laugh like that it was intelligent enough to end its call like whatever it was communicating with or saying or doing with then another imitated animals wild and i heard and then i read later this is why I kind of doubted I did initially, but then I had seen later that, yeah, it, that, that, that this, what they mimic, they've, there's other reports of them mimicking other animals. So, yeah. It, oh, owls, it's, especially. It's the night, that oh, they, they do the, the coo and the, ooh, and the, oh, yeah. and have you heard, have you heard the 
cougars. That cougars actually have multiple different sounds to mimic birds. And it's like, you would not be able to tell unless you had known this. Like a chirping type sound they make. You're chirping, now that you said that, I had never thought of that, but I experienced that chirping the one time I was almost ambushed with uh, a mother cougar teaching its adolescent cougar <gasps> how to hunt at uh, the river uh, park, actually within Calgary, um, down wow. at New Discovery. And luckily it was myself, my ex-girlfriend, and my two past uh pit bull slash english mastiff cross dogs so that there was four of us and that um at the end of the pathway was the adolescent cougar and it looked like an oversized giant golden retriever with a giant oversized uh tail and that uh it was like hopping up and it was like cooing and chirping towards oh. the ground. And then the it was a chirp that originally got my attention, and I looked next to me, and there was a bush about ten feet uh, behind the bush on the pathway that we were at, and immediately next to us, just about so it was five feet, then ten feet, about twenty, fifteen to twenty feet next to us was the mom sitting, watching us, staring, oh. ready to pounce. Wow. But because there was the two dogs, myself and my ex, that it decided uh, not to, and that it was um, a fenced at the other end, and that the the young or the adolescent was playing the bait role, but it had gone into the fence, and then it was struck like uh, struggling to clear this 10 foot fence and like had like entrapped itself kind of sort of thing. So that yeah. the mom was then more worried about it. And we just, I was like, Ooh. to my ex and he, cause like she was still trying to figure out and realize that it was a baby cougar. And I was like, okay, we need to go. And she was like, what? I'm like, just turn around and like took her. And she was like almost fighting me, but I did not let her know about that cougar right there. Cause as soon as, you know, they sense uh, fear, yeah. we could have been after. And then we just walked off. And then like uh, when we got about 20 feet back, she then saw the mom move and like run to the baby. And it was just oh. like, Oh my God, how the heck? we just survived that and Yikes. then as we were walking back about like a half a minute to a minute later uh literally maybe 200 meters um back like towards the parking lot uh there was like this other lady jogger with like headphones in and a little chihuahua and we're like trying to like wave her down to stop and she like tried to dodge us and kept going and then like we finally got her and then she stopped it and was oh like, good and saved her life She's like what are these crazy these crazy people are trying to kidnap me <laughs> like, no, 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 it's over, it's over. i know like, i ran uh, like, encounter the other day but everybody had left and then i realized why i ran into it <laughs> because everybody else was gone <laughs> <laughs> well like tranquil uh, vortex, vortex in large the the like tranquil is, vortex like, in the chat is saying that uh and anybody who owns a house cat will know that, you know, if your cat sees a bird outside the window, it will make a little chattering or chirping sounds. Uh, I used to have a exactly. cat. And it <laughs> used to do that all the time. Yeah, when it would see a bird or a squirrel even, but mostly birds. So I can actually uh, get my cat to do it. Loudly. Sorry. You have a mix with the house cat. You get um, what's called a savanna cat. And they also chirp really loudly. But mm. after a few generations, they stop doing it. Interesting. Oh, so maybe a and I also thing, heard that yeah. cougar, or not cougars, cheetahs don't, they meow and purr. They don't roar. I think uh, maybe yeah, they do. The hyoid smoke. bone isn't fused, so they can actually purr. Oh. Yeah. There yeah, you it, go. It, it's one or the other, basically. Either you purr or you roar. Got you. Okay. But yeah, cougars, um, they can make really loud shrieks that sound like a woman being murdered. It kind of freaks you the first time you hear it. Yeah, it's very yeah. bone chilling. Yeah, yeah. I've been listening to it um, because I go out so much by myself. I want to be like really aware of the sounds around me. 
Seven, what you like, described oh, was literally what the adolescent cougar was sounding like. It was almost heartbreaking. The sound, like the how how distressed sounding its chirp cry was, sort of thing. Like yeah, calling for its mom. And it was like, oh my god, don't murder us. <laughs> There's some crazy encounter videos out yeah. there. But you gotta stand oh, your you've ground. You've seen that one. I have it saved. If you want to actually watch it right now, the one where the guy, gosh, where was that? Was that California? It wasn't far from where I'm at, but he accidentally ran up on some cubs, and mom just got super pissed and chased him up a hill, and it's real scary. You want to oh, see yeah. it? They are fast, and like they will okay. jump around corners and stuff. They are, <laughs> they are <laughs> apex predators for a reason. Yeah, they're huge. They uh, mount lions or cougars here in North America are huge. Let me find it here. Yeah, and if they you like truly bend are. Over, they're, they're the same size as lions, jaguars, and tigers. If you like bend over to tie your boots or something and you get jumped on your back, you're pretty much boned because they go straight for the neck. A lot yes. of hikers. Yeah, I don't I want a mountain bike so bad, but like most of the attack cases were people on their bikes or a lot running. Of, uh, a lot of hikers and mountain bikers will wear a hat that has eyes painted on the back of the hat. Oh, yeah, or a yes. mask. Yeah, yeah, here we that's go. Very right common. Back. Yeah, found it. It was in Utah. Okay, here I'll pull it up. Oh wait, I gotta pull this in Chrome so you can hear the audio. Ironically, this is important because he did he did all the right things to scare this thing off or to keep it off. Sorry, the, go ahead. The most affectionate cats, uh, oddly enough, is the cheetah, which you, you wouldn't really expect since they are like rush down predators. But yeah, and they so tend to be loners too. Right? <laughs> yeah, they, yeah, travel in small groups. Where's my chrome? And that's why also having spike collars on your canine best friends while hiking in the mountains will also help give them an extra fighting chance. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and if you can, um, you just get a shotgun. I, they're not expensive. It's worth you don't have to shoot the animal itself. You shoot in front of it so that it decides not to continue to attack. Well, they make bear bangs. Run off. Like it's basically a blank, and well. you shoot it in front of you and scares the bear off or whatever the animal is. It and just, if not, yeah. you have buckshot or slugs right after that you can use to. You can, can use bear it. spray. Specifically, yep. it's that thicker foam versus just the light, you know, mist. Okay, why can't I find my chrome in all of a sudden? Yeah, bear spray and pepper spray can be dodgy, right? Uh, if the wind is coming at you and you spray that stuff, you're going to get more of it than whatever's trying to chase you down. That's why I think that's a joke um, that, you know, you can tell a black bear's poop and a grizzly bear's poop apart because one has uh, undigested leaves in it and the other one smells of pepper spray and has dog collars in it. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. Yeah, some of those big grizzlies up here in Alberta in the Rocky Mountains, uh, you know, pepper spray or whatever. That's just a added spice. You know, it's just to flavor up whatever they're about to eat. Put a little cayenne pepper on this human. Delicious. Actually, cayenne pepper is a decent repellent. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. Right, they don't like you spicy, they want you plain and bland or with cheese and bacon. <laughs> Black like people don't season the humans. Watch, see, watch, bam, mom. Oh, this is wait, it'll show it better. He just saw the cub, and now mom is running at him. Oh, wait, maybe that was a different cub starting to run at him, and now mom's gonna chase him here in a second. He, it's gonna show her in a second. This is one of the craziest videos i've ever seen and where is this it didn't sound like this is utah does it i didn't get the oh. audio to he's really he just is like hey hey when every time oh, it, yes yes it, i know oh yeah it like for like a couple minutes keeps it like yeah he goes yeah. wait see how it's oh. charging at him and he's got to keep challenging it back to yeah, keep it at the yeah, calling at yeah, the ground and everything yeah 
Yeah, and you yeah. don't want to get this scratched. This guy literally played <laughs> no. the only way you could play it, fighting for his life with his wits and not backing down while backing up the entire time. Yeah, you have yep. to maintain head on. Like, you have to stare at it the whole time. This is why oh, exactly. I you make eye contact with all animals and that you can establish the neutral respect of that, like, I'm not going to kill you while you're not going to kill me. And eventually, especially if they're not defending their young, uh, a lot of time they will reach an understanding and respect and go their own ways. The other thing I've been learning, because even with lions, like, it's kind of a joke, but they say, like, carry a stick. Because you can keep a lot of animals at bay with like a long stick, so get used to hiking yeah. with a walking stick, which is what that, I, I'm starting to do too. On top, that of used it. to be a rite of passage apparently for Maasai boys uh, as part of their tribal rituals uh, into manhood, was oh. to run up and and slap a lion with a stick. Apparently, oh. <laughs> Yeah, every time I hiked in the mountains in California, I always took a walking stick with me, and I've chased off a few different bears um, and a mountain lion <clears throat> by just by tapping on this, you know, hitting the tree, hitting a rock, making loud noise, um, and like yeah. burning. What you were saying earlier with the shotgun, if that guy had a shotgun right now and shot a couple of rounds in front of that cat, it would be gone in a second. Yeah, yeah. You don't have to shoot the cat. You just got to shoot in front of it so it sees what's coming. Yeah. And the loud noise scares them off most of the time anyway. Yeah. And as a reminder, these cats weigh between 100 and 150 pounds. Right there, yeah, like, look at, like, look, oh look at that. Like, oh, my God. And, uh, and, and, yeah, this is more terrifying than a wolf by far. Oh, yeah, I agree. Know. I have more now, fear. This is, this is my biggest fear. Imagine a saber-toothed tiger that, tiger that was 10 to 20 times the size of that and had two giant machetes as teeth. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, uh, a regular Bengal tiger is five times the size of this and then five times again the size for a saber tooth. Well, uh, Chris, oh, CC yeah. Water 99, uh, crapping your pants would probably make you uh, less attractive a meal. So um, <laughs> I guess. Yeah. Yeah, I that's why coyotes eat. shit themselves when a They're predator's like, the chasing meat them. The meat has away. turned sour. Yeah. I don't want your human <laughs> GMO butt anymore. I much prefer pepper spray. <laughs> this is a very scary video. My right? Man. Like, oh, I know. I know. It's, it's, it's six hard. minutes long. Can you imagine? Like, because right? you'd probably like, just be thinking you're going to die any minute. No, oh, no, no. no. You rush. can't think you're going to die because the I agree. you do, you yeah. it and it's yeah. going to attack you. You'd be shaking was... for hours after. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You wouldn't, yeah, you wouldn't you would. sleep That's for really days. what I mean. Like, once you once the adrenaline wore off, you would definitely be in a uh, little that entire time you're so pumped yeah. with adrenaline because you're ready to attack it as it attacks you and you defend yourself. Like Yeah, yeah. Except you don't exactly. have claws, so <laughs> have fun with that. Well, yeah, definitely you'd want to have a couple boulders in your hand at that point to at least try to blunt and knit and block the Yeah, claws hit it in the head. Hit it the eyes. It's just like yeah. If this a was rock, me filming this, the audio stick, like you know, like something to jab and to bash would be your best bet. <laughs> well, well if, if it's gonna bite something, on. give it your forearm at least, so it's not your neck. Well, you let it get yeah. bite the stick first, or scratch the stick, and then you smash with the the stone, and that's your like one two to try to get it before it claws you or bites you, and you're done. I do keep my yeah, eyes peeled for like large rocks. While I'm walking in case like I didn't need to pick it up and use it too. But you know, the other benefit of using a walking stick is you're actually grounding yourself um, if you can't be barefoot. Uh, so it's sort of like an extra tool that way too. Well, it's mm, even yeah. more useful during winter because when you're walking, you can test the ground to see if it's ice. And then it just runs fall. off like that. And it's like, okay, time to go back to my cubs. You're out of my territory. <laughs> yeah, that, that's basically what it is. Yeah, you're it's in the bear's territory far enough now. Away. Got far enough away from cubs that it uh well, that's incredible that's an amazing video yeah i'd be oh yeah look at his shaking hands. yeah 
He's like, this holy fuck. Oh, oh, he it's was, over. Really, he, if you hear the audio, he was pretty. He, he was shaky, but oh, he yeah. was calm. He was, did the great job with that. So anyway, I thought you guys yeah. would enjoy that. Absolutely. Jeez, bless that guy. That's amazing. That's amazing. Right? If that was me and I was filming that, the whole audio would just be me crying the whole time. Oh, I would just no, be no. crying He's like, like a child. Fuck you. Get out of here. He's like, Lots I don't know. Like, yeah, yeah, I'd be yelling a lot. Yeah, then yeah, like would... when I saw the bear, you just like instincts do kick in. And so both times, I just immediately, I was a little shaky, but I just immediately go, hey, bear, hey, bear. I start putting my hands up real big, and I start slowly backing away with my face towards it because mm-hmm. I didn't know where mom was. You know, mom was somewhere near there, I think. But And you just make yourself clear. And then as soon as I got space and I didn't see anything, I ran a little bit, to give myself a little <laughs> extra space, and then I continued to walk backwards. And then you, 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 you end up working your different muscles as you do that. So, you know, it's a... It's a win-win, guys. The thing about bears, uh, you're a little safer in the sense that, first of all, they're bigger, so they're easier to spot. And they, they actually have crappy vision, especially compared to cougars and wolves. Oh, so but they can smell you easy. far away. Yeah, their yeah. sense of smell is just as good, but their vision isn't cool. all that great. So they're slightly and- easier to evade and confuse if you have experience with a bear. But That's, I mean, I've made bears, wolves, I've never seen and, a lot of noise. So, yeah, what you're saying makes sense. I was actually confused. I ran into it because I constantly, when I know I'm by myself, and I'll have like a thing that I can with my water bottle. I have like a hydro flask, you know, so it makes that ting noise that, and I'll make yeah. it go ping, ping as I'm walking. And a lot of times I just go, I'll talk to my dog really loudly, like, how you doing? You know, <laughs> like obnoxious. Anyway, so when I saw it, I was kind of confused. I, the only thing I could think of was that all the noise I was making actually stirred it out from where it was, thinking it could hear me coming and thinking it needed to move or smell me coming. And then, and that's how I ended up, because it was like 100 yards away. It wasn't like super far away. Well, that's the but, thing. It doesn't really matter because it can smell you coming further than you can see it coming, most likely if you're in a forest or something. Yeah. And they run faster than Usain Bolt. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah, most bears around what forty mile per hour on a flat, you know, straight straightaway in terms of sprinting. So even if you say okay, you know, thirty mile per hour in a wooded area, I mean, you're you're toast. Yeah, but you got to run downhill. <clears throat> they can't run as fast downhill, and they'll actually stumble. You yeah. know, they got all the power going uphill, but um, <clears throat> they they get pretty klutzy and clumsy when they're trying to run downhill. Oh yeah, don't think you can climb a tree to get away from a bear either. No, no. work. No, because black bears can climb as good as monkeys, and a grizzly bear might even just push your tree over. So either way, you're Mm -hmm. kind of screwed. Yes, Jelly and Rachel, uh, bears are really, really fast. Yeah, bears charge like no other. can't run at that speed for extended periods of time but as a sprint you know if you're 20 30 feet feet 50 feet away from a bear in a sprint uh, they've got you in a blink of an eye yeah those claws are not something to play with So uh, that's why I strongly recommend getting at least a 10 millimeter. Because yeah. okay. if you get attacked, you want to be able to, you know, I get think it the fact that I, gets to you. Yeah. 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 Uh, I apologize. I'm interrupting a lot. I was just going to say that I think that this, uh, this encounter, because I've actually had, I've had a lot of animal encounters in my life. And so I feel like this is a sign I need to, I need to be prepared. Yeah. Aim for the throat. It's the it's the uh, most vulnerable spot on a bear. If you if you're in that life or death crisis, you know um, that's where you got to aim for is right for the throat because anything else is just going to make them mad. Oh yeah, the <laughs> skull at some spots is what like two inches thick or something insane like that. I've seen yeah. skull wow. shots from a forty five seventy that didn't go through, like yeah. just glanced off. So like, yeah, yeah and their no, skulls you- are shovel shaped too. And, oh, sorry, it's 30 miles per hour, not 40. Sorry, pants on the ground is correcting me, my mistake. Still, either way, that's fast as hell, man. 
Yeah, I pretty much grew up in Sequoia National Forest, so I used to see bears all the time. Very and, cool. Uh, yeah, and we had we always had a shotgun, um, and we actually had bear slugs just in case, um, mm -hmm. which are kind of lead hollow point slugs. And like I sh we had a ten gauge shotgun. Um, my dad was <clears throat> loading it with the bear slug told me to shoot it into this oak stump and it went into the oak stump maybe about three or four inches around and the whole back of the oak stump was completely gone oh yeah so, back face yeah. deformation and uh yeah you're uh, very right pants on the ground um moose are very very dangerous but they are mm. rarer than bears so there's that yeah. yeah and it depends on where you're at like up in panhandle of idaho moose are really common but the moose are terrifying because, like, if one picks a fight with your truck, the moose wins. <laughs> you know it. Yeah, a moose is bigger than a horse, so they're pretty incredible animals. That's the thing, see, when it, if you hit an elk, if you you know, and you're not don't see it in the road, it'll just destroy your car. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They're, they're like six foot tall at the shoulder, and then their head is another like four, five, six feet, and then they have their huge fucking crown on top of that. Like, yeah, no. And they're, it can be like six feet wide. So <laughs> if if they don't like you, that's a bad day. Yeah. Isn't it ironic that the most beautiful creatures out of nature are also the most deadly, right? Cougars, um, uh, moose, elk, you know, bears, wolves. Did you guys ever watch that Grizzly Man documentary. You talking about the guy who uh, lives with uh, a couple bears? I saw no. one where he's with like a polar bear. Uh, apparently, oh. his wife what? is not very liked by it. <laughs> oh, the polar bears! That I feel like they're more unpredictable, and maybe it's just because we don't like live oh, around them as much. But they seem to angry. be like, yeah, yeah, they seem to mess with humans way more than grizzlies do overall what's even worse though is that you can have a hybrid of a polar bear and grizzly and they are bigger and more aggressive than both oh i didn't know they were bigger oh are you talking about the uh one where the guy's up in alaska and thinks that he's part of the family of grizzly bears and then gets yeah. eaten yeah well it's a little yeah. more complicated than that he ends up he's in a group of them that like is they regularly get for a while, but he, he knew that he was going to get eaten by the one bad well, one, and then it happened. He thought he was a bear whisperer because of this one group of bears that was regularly used to human interaction, and he ended up deciding he was going to go to this remote island where they were starving to death because he was going to bring awareness and bear whisper these guys and save them is what he said, even though he didn't bring food for them or anything. And he ended up getting stalked and eaten, but the whole, his inner, he's like rolling around with these bears and Denali, these grizzly, huge grizzly bears and like interacting with them on a daily basis before he goes to the island. It's just kind of an interesting story, regardless of his stupidity in it. it Cause he had no, he had absolutely zero training he did minimal research before he went into doing he this. He was a legitimate temporary bear whisperer, but at the same time, he was absolutely reckless and idiotic and yeah. got himself a Darwin Award. He wasn't because a bear whisperer. He, he just like, he was interacting he with bears. Have some sort okay. of self-defense at the very least. The, the bears were getting fed by the rangers out there. So they were used to being well supplied. They weren't starving. Like all yeah, those things. A big difference. Yeah. They probably yeah, grew up with difference. people around them. Yeah. Hey, hey guys, so I got a jump. Um, so if I could. I need a documentary. Sorry about. Oh, I was just going to say, uh, I got a jump here. Um, <clears throat> wanted to uh, drop in a quick plug. I built a website, thefounders.life, and the whole point of the website is for us to have our own community, which is not um, censored in any way, where we can all like join and have forums and, and discuss this in, a, in a, another format off of YouTube. Um, so the founders dot life, if any of, of you want to go there, I've got playlists on everything from electroculture yeah. to right. Tartaria, you know, private chat, and I will bring it up and sorry for interrupting, please continue. And we got to show this. 
Cool. Yeah. Cause, uh, you know, I really think that like the more we can come together and gather together as a community and share these ideas and concepts and information, um, you know, we're going to touch more people and more people are going to wake up to what, you know, that the fact that history is not, um, perfect, <laughs> you know, by any means. And that, um, you know, and something real quick, but before I go, we we're talking about earlier was the uh, highly mineralized water and salt water, right? That would co cover air, all these areas within the mud flood. Um, and what I've been studying really hard is the area of Spanish peaks in Colorado, and then also uh, ship rock in New Mexico. And they're actually, these two points are not far from each other. Um, but the Spanish peaks area, if you look at Spanish peak, from Google, it looks like a medicine wheel of walls going out. And so the same thing with Shiprock. It looks like it was like some big castle in the center with all these walls going out, and these walls are yeah. super high. And it, and it looks as if, you know, the, the geologists say that um, it is, a lot of it is quartzite in the center. So, you know, it got, um, quartzite is obviously, you know, um, petrified material um so anyway just something to check out uh, you know i i think that similar to the star forts there were areas where they built these i mean these things are like two three stories tall or or longer and some of these walls go for like five or six miles or more and uh and then the one called that um goes down through stonewall colorado that literally goes all the way from canada to mexico and and you see all these portions of walls all over the place and then you see all this silt and stuff that has come up against them from obvious mud floods so anyway just something to ponder something i wanted to throw at bernie because i think this you know coincides with some of the uh stuff that he's looking into with the geoglyphs and stuff because oh, literally so right right outside of stonewall there's a huge geoglyph right there of a native american's head and a little bear head um that's in that area so anyway check out my channel i've got a couple videos on that but please everybody go join the founders dot life and uh let's uh keep the conversations going on these topics can you pretty please put the link in the private chat right now and i will yeah. post it uh in the live chat for everyone yeah i'll do it right now yep thanks and thank you as well yeah, as yeah. Uh, the link to your channel please yeah all your links before you go you gotta post okay them. man <laughs> yeah so here's uh whoop. here's the founders life link i'll drop that in it's the founders dot life um for those listening and there's that one and then uh my youtube channel is anna Deluvia in america just like the name um why can i not find oh there we go there we go my computer's just slow and a boom there we go. Oh my god, what stupid stupid twitchiness of my fingers that I hey I did get it right. Okay. Here we go. And awesome. On the Facebooks, on the Twitch, on the Twitter, on the YouTubes. It's posted everywhere now, as well of as course. Make sure you go subscribe to William at Antediluvian American on YouTube as well. America. America, sorry. Here we <laughs> go. There it is. Kaboom. I spelled it right. That's right. Hey, right on. All right, all right guys. Good. Peace out. Uh, look forward to talking to you all again Bye. soon. For Great sure. Much you, love. Nice to meet you. Thank Take you. Care. All right. Peace. Thanks a lot. Have a blessed Thanks. rest of your weekend. And I will make sure myself to click on that link on the founders.life and we'll create it. Do you have a uh, YouTube you post his uh, YouTube channel too? Or somebody could do that? Oh, you did. Uh, Thank you. Yes, you did. I definitely you did. did. You got to <laughs> go subscribe. And I already um, subscribed to Founders, so get your butts over there.
I really, the, I'm big on the community discussion too. I've talked about the idea of a PMI or PMA a lot. And that, you know, I, I, my big thing is it takes a village. I feel like in some format, even if we end up smalling, like, or forming smaller communities, this is something that we should be trying to do. I mean, if we could, what if we could all have a research facility that we could all come and spend time at that, you could put in a little bit of money and ahead of time in, in the while we're building or, or part of the build, but then that money isn't something you have to pay to come back in to use our facilities, you know, and that's something on top of the research facility I've because I want to do research with healing methods, but to have an actual healing and wellness center where there are people who are um, been doing these practices for a long time that can teach you how to do it yourself so that you can be independent. And this isn't about, you know, trying to make money. Anyway, I think we should be having this discussion more. Right, more collectives, 100%. And the Health and Wellness Center is a great uh, place and way and topic to start. I here think we're going to start one in Oregon so we can do psilocybin because it's legal here. So, And I'm actually going to start the process and do my application to become a facilitator. So come on down and I'll take you for a ride. <laughs> Heck yeah, sister. I like it. And well, there's going to be the weekend at Burn Eyes Getaway uh, Music Festival eventually. And oh, yeah. well, that, that'll be another psilocybin psychedelic uh, adventure. I got course. the speakers for that. They're right? four by four and they have uh, lighted platforms on top so you can dance on them. And they're about 250 watts. They're made for concerts. So nice and Beautiful. Loud. I think yeah. you might be able to find somebody who knows a thing or two about lasers also. Maybe, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. I, I don't know. That might be kind of hard. <laughs> like, look at all of these mountain-topped, terraformed terrace, like, cities throughout South America and the Andes, and then that there's also this throughout... South Africa, like Michael Tellinger has documented and shown, and then of course all throughout uh, Asia, as Southeast Asia, China, everywhere, the terraced mountain agriculture and yeah, the, half the of it's abandoned. The terraces are built on contour in order to collect water from rainfall. That's why it's designed in that fashion. I've studied that completely. It seems a lot of uh, old world walled cities were terraced like that. Even Quebec City is not only a walled city, but it's got terraces as well. I believe there's five yeah. that you can see, but there's probably there's probably more that have been developed on top of and so on that are kind of hidden now. You had to be able to defend the food, right? Very true. Uh, and it was structured water, electroculture on top of it, all designed into one. That last one looked like a bus stop. Look almost. at that. That right there. Like, See, I kind of wonder if it's primary water. That Jeremiah, definitely is primary water. I well, dr Jeremiah had brought... He brought up this guy that brought built a pyramid in Florida, and his pyramid was always flooding, and so was around the land, because from the understanding was is it was pulling that primary water up. So I wonder if pyramids are kind of built that way. Maybe the river Nile was supplied by the pyramid itself when it was in operation, rather than it being in front of the pyramid. I don't know. It's just a, you could a be right. Like, and how is that not like, look at all the black charring scarring, like, that was an apartment complex. I time. bet you that was gorgeous in its time. Like, oh yeah, with plants and stuff probably everywhere. Oh yeah. And there's just so much evidence of that, those buildings into the rock like that all over the Southwest and Colorado. That dome structure, it, was that Celtic? Which one? Like, where's that? So that's that's insane. This the one on the side of the mountain. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Wow. What China. Is that? This is uh, a lift in China. Wow. Oh, okay, that makes sense. Then. <laughs> well, look, it's the same red sandstone, and this is the one that has like the crazy like uh, carvings in these giant 
pillar things. I, I got to get a better picture of it. But, uh, right? That like, is really nice. So this That's one, gorgeous. apparently, they recovered these canals in the 50s or 60s with heavy machinery, but they re-dug out that they were filled in so that it was an ancient megalithic canal building that they weren't even functioning for hundreds of years. Until of course, in modern out. times, it took heavy machinery to excavate exactly. all Exactly. How they right? did in ancient times. Yeah, incredible. And it seems that the Netherlands and Holland has a lot of those beautiful, fully intact and still with the moats or the water around them, uh, star forts and star cities that are still inhabited. There's villages in them and everything. They're beautiful. Like the fact that the half of humanity just accepts like the narrative. Oh yeah, primitive people built this giant underground facility, apartment, dam complex uh, for worship. It, like what no like that yeah like that looks like the remains that'd be impossible sort of functioning damn power plant something from my understanding worship came in in the 1600s before that it was workship wasn't it workship right the workship at the workshops it would be where to live instead of where to or where to be instead of where to yeah, it's where you got fed, you got your education, so that you had your craft sort of thing. So this specific architecture and brickwork, stonework, where they have these minarets or whatever the heck these uh, spherical tools. Yeah, that, right? Like, <laughs> we don't build that anymore, and it's on all of the castles and star forts everywhere. Can we build that anymore? Right? We even see a lot of that sort of thing on what they're calling armory buildings here in, yep. in Canada and in the U.S. too. You know, pretty much every exactly. city had an armory, and we see that type of design. Yep. Uh, deactivated Stargate? I would say. It was probably like covered water. With gold, silver, copper, and all sorts of metal sheets and nanotransistors and circuitry at one point, I would imagine. I think the uh, the actual carving itself is the circuitry, but you're right. I think it was covered in silver and gold. As this was. and Or, sorry, mercury inside of it, and uh, it was covered in not schist. Mica. Mica, this one yes, looks Mica. a lot like the bent pyramid. Yeah. Completely covered. Yes, good point. It does resemble the angles of the bent pyramid a decent amount. How and much it, goes beneath the ground? I wonder. The all sorts of tunnels and mercury-filled tunnels they found. We need lidar of all of that. Oops. That's crazy. I love it. This is uh, the one Indonesian pyramid made with all the basalt blocks. Nun, nun, pun, dun, nun, oh my god, I always get the mess up. The one grand or something. No, that's the island one. Yang Piang, I believe. Yes, yes. Say that again. You know you Yang oh, Piang, god. I think. Yeah. But my yeah. pronunciation could be off because I'm just a Canadian fella. Eh? Just a Canadian, eh? Yeah, eh? So, you know, eh? Off, eh? so a guy will mispronounce stuff, good, you know? but that's, that's, yeah. You well, know that's so Bob Greener. Hello. Good doctor, sir. Hello. Good morning, Bob. Good doctor, but thank you all the same. Hello, hello. Glad to have you. We're going over geopolymer and pyramid uh, technology and structure at the moment. Very good. I believe this is a, a pyramid mountain in uh, the Siberian Eastern Russian area. There's a whole complex. Is it really a mountain? 
right? And well, and it, how much it resembles the step pyramids within uh, the Grand Canyon pyramid complex. Well, where's right? the expression to move a mountain from? Good I think it's something to do with yeah. Muhammad, isn't it? Yeah. Right? Because like that to that, that to that, right? And it's like if it was pre cataclysm a, pre under a lot of water well yeah right like that that's what i'm i suspect like especially for this place that they would have had it dammed up and like been like a giant lake city sort of thing that they would have been sailing about essentially oot in a boot on a boat <laughs> Uh, Bob, now that we have you, though, with the geopolymer, um, have you seen the channel of Paul Cook's work where he's a fellow United Kingdom uh, citizen as yourself, but he's found that there's this red lime or red sandstone, they call it, and then this white and red limestone layers, they call, that he has found, especially throughout the UK, but uh, that they're also in Malta, they're also like in Jordan, uh, where, throughout Petra and stuff. And then I suspect it's the exact same stuff as this entire macro structure of the Grand Canyon. But that uh, he claims and is finding evidence that it is all one giant geopolymer layer. And um, the evidence especially in the UK and the UK cave systems that it seemed like they're built leftover um, complexes and a layer from a past civilization. I confess I haven't. Um, I can understand how silicon dioxide in the form of sand and calcium carbonate uh, could form an aggregate and uh, binder mix whether that's natural dissolved from water movement through sand grains carrying calcium carbonate, making calcite, or whether it's a, a deliberate act, I don't know. I, I think both could occur. And so maybe something- well, Now that I think about it, because of how you've shown with like the wind hex and like the theory that they would essentially just grind down the material from on the spot and then remake it as the geopolymer essentially or cast it very close by that then they uh, a lot of this could be natural and then they specific areas could be built up or reused or uh, made into well the i mean you could just look at cultures around the world troglodyte cultures and so on they they they, they take a natural formation and they cut into it, but they then might create facing stones out of chunks of the same material or possibly to create a geopolymer out of the same material to, you know, produce window frames and, and door and archways and stuff. But like, it makes much more sense. Like if I was to go to Mars, I would start by making my homes underground. Firstly, uh, if you can create maybe a, a plasma-based, HHO-based system, to create living accommodation and tunnels and, and service facilities and, and factories and stuff. If you could use the system that would vitrify the walls and seal them and they're underground, you're then able to pressurize those with atmospheric pressure uh, yes. to live. So, you know, a lot less dangerous than exposed bubbles or domes outside and then fully. Well, I mean, they're not having to create the building material. It's, it's attractive manufacturing, isn't it, as it were? And if you can use a technology that might make the material disappear, you don't even have to deal with the waste. So, um, you, you know, the, there's, a, there's a lot of reasons why you would use that kind of technology. So, um, but in terms of the geopolymers I, I had a thought recently based on a recent presentation that i gave that the wind hex appears to leave for instance metals uh, magnetic but it also leaves particles free flowing and spheroid and so i thought that maybe this whole concept around uh, extra relic neutrinos in materials 
causing a in uh, the way electrons interact with each other uh, to change on various levels from you know removing van der Waals or Casimir forces all the way through to causing nucleon decay um, and also making water molecules fall apart. If you can imagine you're starting with let's say uh, calcium carbonate and you grind that up if it is oversaturated i.e the the atoms are too excited to be able to bind together that might explain some of the free-flowing behavior coming out of a wind hex uh, there is almost like they're charged and so they kind of partially re repel each other but just like the russian uh, uh, cold metal forming that was reported in 1992 by tom bearden with a team that he sent over to moscow the group uh, out of the former en energetics research they were able to turn, for instance, aluminium into jelly and then put it into a mold and then drain off the excitation. I wonder if you actually need to do anything other than take the powderized material, put it into a box and pound it into so it's well compacted. And potentially over time, these charge clusters will dissipate either through moisture, natural moisture or air moisture or whatever. And it rebinds together. Um, it, it might actually be that you don't actually have to do anything. So, so metal you, injection you go, molding without the sintering process, basically? It, yeah, it kind of self-sinters. Um, so it's kind of like it, it, there is a thing called uh, compression welding. And so what have we got here? Yeah, and there is vibration welding as well, which, which is well, well, the vibration level. welding. I can literally be have a sample of aluminum jelly that I specifically have isolated to send you, and it is clear aluminum jelly. Okay, fantastic. Well, uh, I, I'll be interested to see what that is. <laughs> When you say uh, aluminum or aluminium for us on this so, side, of the jelly from, is it? It is jelly that came and formed off of a literal roll of aluminum foil. It is the aluminum foil physically turned into this clear jelly. But did you mix something like calcium hydroxide in there? Uh, just it, normal it salt water that, too, that uh, was below it, and I turned it. I turned a roll of aluminum foil into an anode going into a bit of salt water but the jelly formed above the water and on a on top of uh well yeah on the aluminum out of the aluminum foil dripping down in towards the water uh but uh, no exposure itself to the salt water just off of the aluminum foil the jellies formed and that I collected. Okay, well, uh, it, it, I, <laughs> when you put it into an SEM, you kind of have to have it dry. <laughs> so is it's, it is uh, it something that will dry? Oh, yeah, uh, it should. Uh, I'll leave it out to let it... Uh, uh, leave, leave a sample so that, so that it can dry. Obviously, then air is going to do something with it. But um, yeah, I mean, when you put it into an SEM, it puts it into a vacuum anyway, and it kind of dries it out. <laughs> I'll show you uh, where it came from. Uh, just give me a second. I'll okay. hop outside. Okay. And... So, yeah. So, the, who was talking about the vibration welding? Oh, that was me. Simon. That, sorry, I don't... Who? who? We Simon. have Simon. Uh, Hi, Simon. Gerald, uh, WPG Enlightened for Truth as well. Uh, that awesome. was on last time with us. Hey, Bob. Uh, Hi, Joe. Frankie. Yeah, I'm the guy who sent you the, uh, the Windhex model the other day. Oh. Uh, uh, we, we, which one? <laughs> uh, the 3D printable one. Oh, right. Okay. The one, the one where you've now put a hot hole in the top, so it's starting to work. Well, uh, I still have to work on the nozzle dimensions because I want to yeah. use the uh, soliton nozzles. But we have the um, <laughs> we have the equation for it, but uh, I yeah. am not going to do that by hand a million times to get the dimensions right. <laughs> no. So uh, until someone uh, makes a calculator so that I can just quickly punch the dimensions in, uh, yeah, that's, that's yeah, pretty much well, that might be something there. I can encourage someone in the community to do. Yeah, it's going to be based. Really it's going to be based on your, well, all, all the parameters. Um, but it, it, individuals will have different capabilities of being able to inject a certain amount of air. Um, and that might be the key parameter for that particular individual. So uh, yeah, because you mentioned that the solitons uh, they like to 
like chase each other front to back, right? So I uh, if you've got one in front, uh, it basically, if you can imagine, uh, it, it 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 has this thing where it, it like an aerofoil. It's kind of like an aerofoil around all the all the way around it. So it has a low pressure on the inside, yeah, uh, slightly behind it, and then a high pressure on the outside, and that kind of pulls it through the medium, the fluid whether that's the ether, the a gas, a plasma, or, or a liquid, uh, or indeed a solid, if it's a, a non-charged structure that's being able to go through a solid. Um, so it, behind it, it's got kind of like a, a, a zone where it creates a low pressure. And so the... Ah, uh, yeah, okay, I see what you mean. Yeah, 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 yeah. so it's kind of well, like... It's, pressure it's kind of like a well in which it falls into, and as it gets closer to it, it gets pulled in... And, you, you, if you look at those sprites videos, you can see them coming in from the side and wrapping on and merging. You can see them coming from behind. Um, and yeah, it, it, you'll be able to see air solitons done by divers where the same thing occurs. Yeah, I, I was looking at a thing, a German um, project where it was basically a giant vortex cannon, but they filled mm -hmm. it with a very fine coal dust. And so when right. they fired it, the coal dust would ignite and it would keep feeding the vortex and keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And it was for anti-aircraft use. Right. Well, that's the, I mean, these, if you've seen divers underwater create a, a soliton, they're able to knock over um, stones that have piled up underwater at quite some distance. Um, and and I, so the, the structures are for very stable. Sorry, what? I just want to interject for a question. I'm sorry. I, um, it's for Bob. It's Gerald here. Is the Windex, is it uh, size dependent? Does it have to be to those parameters that we originally talked about? Or can it be reduced in size? To so some my, my view on the size is, is there will be quantization and resonance involved. Um, and so... That I understand. Yeah, so... If you look at, for instance, the exotic vacuum objects, they're typically like one micron, five micron, 20 micron, 100 micron, or something like that, right? Uh, yep. Because they're, they're kind of fractal. And if you can imagine, um, and so I don't know whether it's that important when you get to a very big one. It might be just very important when it's very small because you're not looking for it to be too, too perfect when it's that big because you're after a very, very weak effect. You're not trying to do nucleon exchange or nuclear decay. You know, you're, right. it's, a, it's a much more subtle effect. Um, but what we're looking at actually at the moment is, you know, the, the Windhex air blowers are uh, coming soon and the other parts are coming. So I'm going to have an update probably this coming week. Um, awesome. And so, hopefully, uh, what what um, Tony has done is he's configured the new design, which you're going to be able to have a look at in the next couple of days, to allow for, you know, if necessary, adding heat in there and adding moisture. I don't think we're going to see really much of anything exciting until there's some means of having charged particles in there. And with the dry, cold air coming out of the um the compressed air tanks and only for a small amount of time you you don't have um the ability to build up charge and uh, charge vortices which is necessary for creating the toroidal uh, moment so i don't know whether S simon maybe uh, i know hank has found that you only get the air coming out the top if you inject quite a lot of air and then you reach kind of some kind of in equilibrium with well, that's why I wanted tours. to put a Tesla valve on the top end so that way the air can only go up and not down the chimney. And that well, the, way these are you're have the these rotation. are interesting additions. Um, but the, 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 the one thing you must do when you're trying to replicate what already works is to never add your own flare. Yeah. <laughs> Always assume to do exactly what the thing did that worked. So the for for the size of the wind hex, I, I'm pretty yeah. well convinced that the entire cavity um, is 
it basically functions as a Helmholtz resonator. So like the entire thing is like stretching outwards and then compressing inwards at a certain rate. And that's going to be dictated by the, the internal volume, but also the size and the length of the nozzle at the bottom. So you could tune it that way, but you're going to have like a very limited range depending on it. We, we've also had discussions of putting an electromagnetic coil at the top of the uh, opening of the Windex and maybe adding some form of uh, electrostatic force to it. So, Or we could throw some electret in there and have that ground up. I see what that does. Or just a straight discharge. <laughs> a spark gap or something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hold on a sec. I've got to flip my burgers. I'll be back in a minute. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm going to be eating charcoal. <laughs> Give me a sec. It of course. Like it. it sounds delicious. No worries, Bob. And thank you for joining in while you can. And, mm, I love burgers. Good old Alberta beef. Um, Miss, I hope they're cheeseburgers. I just am getting my little electrolysis... Uh, reactor going here uh to demonstrate a couple things while we have the good bob with us um but i also have to step outside to go grab that aluminum jelly uh mix i don't even know what to call it just well, i guess it's an electrode hey, i wanted to show I was oh, never mind. I was gonna show these photos and we can do it later, but no, no, by all means, please do right now. Well, it's a little bit back to right before Bob showed okay. up and I change subject. Is it everybody okay with our ADHD layout here? That, that, that's what it's all about. <laughs> we bounce it's all over true. the map. You never know what dots we're gonna connect. So by all means, sister. Well, that's how we encourage variety. Yeah, I think it's we've talked about this, that it's kind of important and that to give people the perspective that even if you think like you just have the creative mindset to sort of activate that more logical mindset and challenge yourself, that's something I've done. And uh, This is that Heart Mountain area where I found those circles. And um, I was going through some of my old photos of the edges. I just thought it was really interesting after you're looking at some of the pyramid stuff. I know it's not exactly in the shape, but um, there's a lot of layering and plateauing in this area. This is uh, considered part of the Modoc plateau. And I'm very curious about that structure in that area. There's a lot of that red sand. There's a lot, you know what I'm talking about that you were showing. Talking about. Anyway, Bob's back. So let's let's get back to what we were talking about. <laughs> I just thought it would be a brief interlude. <laughs> I, don't, I don't want to take up your mind time. Uh, oh, no, no, no. You're, no, Bob, please. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Um, yeah, so in, in my view, we know it works. Uh, how is it working? Uh, I believe it's, it, it's necessary to have the charges in there. Um, when you're talking about this at the extremely small level your things like benzene rings and perovskite structures are creating these you know in chlorophyll there's areas of chlorophyll they're creating this toroidal moment um and it might be that it's more intense when it gets down to a resonant structure that's very very small like that and it might be stimulated in in the case of chlorophyll by specific frequencies of light uh, and so forth so um and probably not green because that's the bit we see. <laughs> Green is the most useless color to a plant. Because <laughs> that's the bit we see. That part's for us, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that bit is, yeah. Uh, um, and in, in, in water, um, red is obviously the most important and infrared. And we know that because when you go lower in water, everything's blue. <laughs> that's the bit that water doesn't want to use. Um, so yeah, it's 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 always the colors you see which are the useless colors to to the thing that um, is is making use of color. Light Don't they frequency. mostly use like uh, blue and purple and red? Sorry, no, water like easy water or, uh, is, is, is stimulating. Hmm? 
for uh, plants, don't they use mostly like the purple and red ends of the spectrum for? Uh, uh, you, yeah, yeah. Well, um, again, I think it might be something to do with water. <laughs> I also wanted to bring up that there's been a lot of discussion about this red-blue shift now uh, in the hyperdimensional anti-gravity uh, and plasma phenomenon discussions going on uh, if we're talking about colors. Do you got any thoughts on that, Bob? Um, I certainly have a, a view on red and green because <laughs> they're, they're, they are complementary colors in color space. And if you look at the um, Valeri Zetalepin presentations from Sochi 2018 on the MFMP YouTube channel, you can see where there are natural and uh, man-made bull lightning structures. And they spin at some ridiculous uh speed I, I can't remember offhand but it's fifty thousand somethings and i think it's 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 not millimeters <laughs> per second um it's incredible speed such that the argument is it's actually changing it's it's red and blue shifting you might say uh, the frequencies of light um i actually think it's polarizing them and i think it's polarizing them because if you look at a toroid like that okay like that Although the, the center of toroid is that way, a fractal toroid would be here and going the other way. So you'd have a toroidal moment coming towards you and a toroidal moment going away. And the way I, the reason I see, say that is because when you look at, we have this thing called the Vega Valley, which came from a brass set stack of brass sheets in a, a Vega experiment. And in one part of that, it produced like a floodplain. And uh, in that floodplain, there was like a blotch patch where you had these hexagons of um, green and then hexagons of red and then hexagons of green and then hexagons of red in lines. And this is an 1868 or whatever Maxwell um, uh, mesh of superconducting electrons, um, which if you look at up-to-date supercomputer versions of it, this is what it should create. But it's spinning one way and it's it's affecting something to do with that copper probably or the copper and, and uh, zinc in there, but probably copper, such that when the light interacts with it, it gives green light back and the other side it gives red red light back. So I think whatever's going on is, is it's leaving a signature in the atomic structure. Um now, when when that look, it, one is it, one is caused by ball lightning, showing this red and green to reflected light, and it's not changing the. It's it's basically doing some polarization to the light in some weird way, and it, it might be because the intense magnetic moments left in non magnetic material, i.e., the, the 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 copper is affected by a magnetic field, and it. This is how I, you, I, I believe you can see some um, strange radiation tracks uh, because I have a polarizer on my microscope. I had a hunch that it would have this intense magnetic field and it would leave the atoms oriented, the nuclei of the atoms oriented as it trans, uh, translated through the material. And when you, when you look at it under, an SC, uh, under a normal microscope and you do use a polarizing filter, something that's not there suddenly appears. So... I think it might be something to do with that. So I'd, I'd encourage people to look at the, uh, in fact, I'll, I'll find that link now and I'll put it into the chat. A chat with everyone in the studio. So Let's Bob, see. Go on. I, I can speak to polarization through a lot of my experiments that I do and I've got multiple videos on YouTube on that when it comes mm -hmm. to magnetic polarization when I spin Basically, the coils create spin through its geometrical form because mm -hmm. it's bifilar. There's a certain balance in there, and the polarization yeah. happens directly in the center of the open core of the coil mm -hmm. and on the outsides. But on the outsides, it's polarized in the opposite direction. So it's, it's interesting the way that it is. I remember, yeah, I, I remember it, you talking about this, yes. So yeah, and as I'm it's, going... Um, Oh, sorry to interrupt. Uh, finish, Giles, and then I'll describe the picture. Well, I was just going to say, as it's polarized in the opposite direction on the outside, it's also um, spinning in the opposite direction as the inner core 
of that coil spin. You, you actually did, did a physical that demonstration, demonstration, I think, of that, right? Yeah, I've done a few, yeah. Mm -hmm. I've, I actually showed, um, I, I froze a coil while it was being pulsed. And if you mm -hmm. look at the video, when I flip the, the brick of ice, you can mm -hmm. see the waveform pattern show up in the coil and the ice block itself. It's pretty interesting. Okay. Wow. So, so I'll, I'll let, yeah, it's something oh, that I, I can definitely show you in the future. Do you have the Excellent. link? I'll open it up and show it. And I also got the link that you posted, Bob. I'll open that up in a sec. Uh, in this, this, so this is an anode that I have that's completely just cop, same copper wire, triple solenoid through. And uh, in this one, it's a green blue alteration. Usually it's blue red alteration that it forms. And going down below the blue submerged into the water, you can't see it or the electrolyte salt water, uh, it actually goes green again and alternates again. And that it, it does these alternating, usually red, blue, red, blue, but here it's green, blue, green, blue uh, patches uh, on the copper and that there's literally nothing changing between, uh, you know, like why, why is it causing like an oxidized reaction on portions of it alternating usually in this red color or in this case green instead of red and then always the blue uh, on the opposite opposing segments but that some must have like high more hydrogen be like a hydroxide instead of just an oxide or something whatever it's doing but that it's doing it in these segments I, I i mean uh, without understanding particularly the chemicals you've got in there or uh, it, I wouldn't. It, it does. It'll do it in just in pure air as well. The copper and it's that it's is it. Why do we make magnets as red and blue south and north poles? And is it is essentially doing is nature doing that itself uh, in these fields in the oxidization and uh, hydrides uh, that it forms and corresponding color relation potentially too I, I could certainly imagine that at some point in the past someone saw something at either end of something that was magnetic that was red and blue and maybe decided that, that would be a good way to represent it <laughs> but and maybe someone could look into the etymology of the coloring of uh, you know magnets but certainly if if you take um something like uh, the juice from a red cabbage and you put uh you know you try and electrolyze it, you'll end up with some you know, purple on one side and red, blue on the other, like reddish on the one side and blue on the other. Right? You, you, you know that experiment, the classic experiment to, to use a, you know, red cabbage water and then you electrolyze it. Oh, right. We're right, like in color. third grade science class. We well, it's, it's exactly um, the, the way it was originally done. <laughs> that, that's where I, I had a, a presentation on this where, where the word ion came from someone looking at, I think it was Faraday, um, doing that electrolysis and saying uh, the two counter rotating vortices that go, that form. Um, he said, oh, well, that looks like an ionic column. And so that's why ions are called ions. Okay, so I, I, I'm going to eat my burger now. I'm going to leave you with that link. But if you look at that link, um, you will see that um, Zatalepin talks about... Oh, uh, I was uh, muted. Sorry, uh, thank you so much for joining in, Bob. But quickly, before you go, uh, 30 more seconds, I will run out with my camera outside to show you the aluminum that... Uh, okay, came... before you go, you can see on the, the, the image when you look at this video that in 2009, natural ball lightning, because of the red and the blue, but it looks green to me, but anyway, red and blue shift on either side of the natural ball lightning, they're estimating that the rotation speed is 100,000 kilometers per second. And in a nat in a man-made one where they've still got red and, and green, but I, I, it looks like red and green to me, but let's say red and blue. Um, uh, it's and got 50,000 uh, kilometers per second. So that is, they're, they're looking at the speed of that rotation based on the, the color shift. 
And that's so, a radius of like 50 microns maximum ish. Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of information in that one presentation. Okay, so uh, get, run outside because, uh, yes. Because, like, uh, for if you're running a lathe, for instance, we have what's called a constant surface speed, where the further away from the center, you know, you're going to have a different speed at the surface where the cutter is, you know, intersecting the part. So, like, if you're getting that kind of rotation at the size of an EVO, that is absolutely ridiculous ripples. Well, you know, the, the presentation that we gave last week uh, with, with um, a potential structure, a toroidal structure of an electron, the, the charge is supposedly moving around at the speed of light, so... <laughs> Yeah, that was that. next level, and I hope you don't mind that I've been uh, sharing and replaying lots of your lectures and streams on my uh, seven and eight hour long uh, multi real science streams. You know what? We're we're an open project, so you know if if we were going to care about that, we should have complained about it sooner. <laughs> right. Fair, fair enough. Right. I guess that kind of goes with. Uh, be an open source. Yeah. Okay. So here you can see the uh, top of the aluminum foil where it's crusted, got a little salty. Then uh, as soon as into the jar area, it starts to form the anode reaction and uh, breaking down into the different ormus and monoatomics and that it's starting to reform the gel like uh, clear aluminum drips off of it and that's what i harvested the aluminum uh clear jelly from is the dripping aluminum coming could off it, of the could bolt. it be aluminum or aluminium hydroxide uh quite possibly as it that, literally that, that would probably be my first guess but my burger is calling so i'm gonna have to apologize and say goodbye <laughs> Bon Fair enough, sir. Thank you very much, Bob. Thank you, and thank you for sharing that with me. Much love and uh, do an electroculture on my purple, silver, gold, and green, blue. Awesome. Uh, atomic golds. Have a good day, awesome. sir. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. <laughs> Cheers, mate. Enjoy your burger. I have that. Oh, too late. No worries. We got to let him. Got to let. The good professor eat his meal while it is still warm. And on that note, we are three hours, don't just past three hours, 33 minutes. We are three hours, 34 minutes in. And I need to get to work today and go plant all of uh, these pots with the seeds to start uh, testing these alchemy waters um last uh thoughts everyone well admittedly everything bob was talking about is way above a guy's pay grade but it was fascinating fascinating stuff so that was really cool that it's was cool to think about the color correlation that he was getting into and yeah the polarization concept and yeah yeah so that was great well, it ties into the water discussion we were having earlier too and how uh, the water is affected through different frequencies whether it's sound frequencies or electrical frequencies so yeah really really super interesting stuff have you seen the guys that have um i don't know how like i've just been seeing a lot more videos of this and of course you always have to be skeptical but um you know we've seen some potential capabilities of like a uh, long-term uh practice of keeping Kijong and these guys are standing out in like not giant bodies of water necessarily like like little rivers or pond type situations and they're showing them doing their movement to you know to gather chi yeah, bring in their the work on their own energy and then they start to do this thing where they start to like push out the water and they're like showing the direction that they're getting it and all of a sudden you'll see the ripples show up 
little light breeze sometimes potentially obviously that could be correlated with the weather but it is a little bit interesting because i've seen them move position and then move it to another area so i feel like all things we mess with uh experimentally as well i mean some of us could i mean practicing i don't know how many of you practice some meditation but start to kind of do some of these on of our own experiments I'm starting. I'm starting yeah. to like a long, long time understanding of how meditation can be very different for people. And um, scientific testing of remote viewing, uh, the yeah, streaming, and uh, like live EG. meditation or like collective conscious uh, streams. I want to start experimenting with probably. Uh, especially on the solstices and equinoxes, full moon, stuff like that. Yeah. Well, I've seen something similar to what Sra was just talking about. Um, I think it was in the earlier mid-90s. There used to be a, a television show called Martial Arts World Tour. And the host of the show would just go to different countries to sort of showcase the different uh, martial arts, where there was sort of territorial differences, cultural differences and whatnot. Uh, but there was um, one episode where they're talking about the Qigong and there were these guys that uh, they were using their voices actually to uh, cause ripples in big uh, colanders of water. Um, and they were standing, you know, 30 yards away. And uh, just by projecting their voice after gathering Qi, they could produce ripples in water. And one guy was actually able to... Um, disable birds in flight small birds in flight oh. with his voice not kill them but yeah. actually just cause them to basically crash land or have to land or or much like if you whistle at a bat you could throw it off course kind of the same idea yeah, yeah, yeah. and um one guy was that saying he could sense. kill insects like large grasshoppers and locusts just by using uh his trained voice it was pretty yeah. incredible stuff I mean, there's so, there's so much more new data like coming out what? with like voice vibration and like a cat's purr and how it heals. So like how humans can create their own healing with, with their own mouth and throat vibration, like throat singing. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Gerald, yeah. you were going to say something. Oh, that's all good. I, I completely gapped it. I went squirrel on you guys. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that's my job. <laughs> well, there is the Inuit throat singing and the Mongolian throat singing as well, right? That uh, um, exactly. one of the theories that I've heard about that is because they had such a limited diet uh, that part of that throat singing helps um, uh, to heal them and compensate for uh, certain parts of the diet that are lacking. So it doesn't affect them physically or physiologically. Also, oh, the Indians have... Uh, the death growl as well, which is apparently a very historical um, musical style that's, you know, several hundred years old at the very least. Yeah, it's so who is this, Simon? Reason, Sorry, who was right? that? In the yeah, uh, the Scandinavian death growl, you know, like in oh, the okay. and stuff. Right, okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah I, I would do it, but uh, I, I don't want to do that right in everybody's ears right now. <laughs> <laughs> kind of want to hear it, though. So um, well, energy. A lot of science. There is a lot of science behind this because this is like what I've gotten into my at a brain camera, my backgrounds. I was a sleep tech for 13 years and um, this there's there's science behind singing and the didgeridoo and you're using that circle. It's a, it's a concept of this type of breathing you're doing and the vibration you're giving off. And so it, that's they've actually been shown that you're strengthening your throat muscles in that area, providing you with better breathing, and then in turn uh, rectifying some people's apnea if they have it, you know, in a mild to moderate, if it's not like related to a direct obstruction or something. So it's, there's real legit, you know, this all connects. That's what's so fascinating. Right, it's all interconnected. It's, and that's what makes these panels and discussions so epic, crucial, and important. Uh, Callum, who is hasn't I haven't seen him in a bit, but he's got um, like he was talking about how he starts his day where he's like does like a series of humming, and he ordinates or he sorry I can't 
<laughs> you guys know me. Sometimes I fumble over myself. But anyway, he um, puts the vibration into certain parts. So like he starts up in the nasal cavity, then he starts in the more central, then he tries to get more into the throat and then even into the diaphragm so that he's resonating those different vibrations like mm, mm, the mm, sacred you know, tones kind of right the and, the and if you guys see it, we used to do a lot more theatrical community type um activity like that together a lot more singing a lot more uh dancing so vibration movement all those things and yeah i'm Your really into uh yeah. I'm really into blues music and there's um, blues harmonica players and in the blues a harmonica is called a blues harp and you play it slightly differently than in let's say you know traditional country or country western music or even rock and roll where you do a lot more inhaling or what they call drawing in through the harmonica as opposed to blowing through the harmonica and they actually extend the back of their throat as they're drawing in to what they call bending the note and it's meant to emulate the African pentatonic scale, which was built upon emulating the human voice using instruments and trying to replicate that as much as they possibly can through bending notes with either stringed instruments or in this case, uh, harmonicas. And it creates, um, it, it brings it down, and I'm not a musical theorist, but it brings it down a semitone or a quarter tone or something like that. And what it does is it creates a different mood in the music. So if they bend the tone down, it creates more of a somber, melancholy uh, form of the of the note, which is why it's kind of known as blues. It, it makes you feel blue. But then if they bend other notes on the harmonica or strings on the guitar, it creates an uplifting, more uh, spiritually enhancing uh, note in the music. So that's why some forms of blues are kind of sad and melancholy and other forms of blues make you want to get up and dance and are more what they call jump blues. So it's very fascinating, again, how music and uh, different wavelengths and frequencies can affect your environment, and affect your, you know, the outer environment as well as your inner environment. Definitely. That was a really great topic to bring up. Yeah, thank you. Well, I'm kind of a nerd on the blues stuff. I don't know. It's a guy's thing. Okay, yeah, we're all we're all pretty geeky here. It's wonderful. <laughs> Thank you, Bernie, for bringing us together. I think he froze. Yeah, I think Bernie. Froze. Yeah, I think we lost him. <laughs> but yeah, okay, that's thanks, Bernie. The oh, there he is. <laughs> Bernie, yeah, you're back, Bernie, but you're muted. Hey, there we go. I can speak again. It finally gave me the option to unmute, reload it, and it crash. <laughs> Everything went completely black for a minute. Okay. Um, I love you all. I love we keep it weird. That's what it's all about. Um, I will quickly share everybody's channels before we end this stream right at the four-hour mark. But before then, here's MontanaMegalist.com. Uh, look at this a star seeding ET conversation with a human. You got what looks like some sort of, you know, maybe reptoid giant, something or other, and a straight up almost Benjamin Franklin looking character face into those rocks. Uh, I find that really fascinating. Um, but I see all sorts of these sort of megaliths around uh alberta which is just north of this the exact same area and especially these sorts and that they are dolems and they're like the siberian giant ones and these massive megalithic uh wall ones especially these style there's so many in southern alberta that i want to check out and hike and that it, they all apparently, when you do go up, have these dolem uh, cave and different uh, giant faces and whatnot, um, leftover remnants 
everywhere, and especially the ridiculously large-sized megalithic walls that are getting to the point of undeniability that they are intelligently built. I love watching their videos. They seem like just really sweet people, and it'd be fun to go on their one of their tours. I'm going to get my passport, Bernie, so we got to do some some cool trips. We should get some huge groups together. It'd be super fun to all go, go to this. Right? Oh, we definitely are doing a meetup here. Uh, but first, we're going to do the Medicine Hat Badland Guardians, and that is going to happen this month 100%. Uh, it's just, it's all coming out at once now. Um, this, no, that's Dragon's Temple. Where's the Eagle Amphitheater? See, like, look at these. This right here, this is exactly what I'm talking about at Mount Yamaniska. It's literally um, at the mountain top, just pathways, intersecting pathways of this exact same uh geopolymer or megalithic uh, block work uh, just and even more more block and right angles uh, than what are being demonstrated here and look good oh, dr uh, Sam there this the medicine wheels also gonna be checking them out in this area as well there's canada's stonehenge that's at least 4500 years old um also close to the medicine hat badland guardians and look at these they're like yeah glacial erratics glacier the ice just magically melted so that everything could perfectly yeah. balance on top of each other yeah, right like, perfectly just like nature's way here we go eagle mount amphitheater this actually reminds me as an identical almost identical feature mountain as uh the back side of the three sisters peaks in canmore uh mm -hmm. which uh i've apparently is the intersection of several different ley lines uh from uh pictures i've seen of it i think from google earth we looked at it and as well as some hikers photos that we could zoom in on it looked like all sorts of actual like different like seats walls carvings and there's legends of uh the three sisters actually being carved into the back side of uh the mountains there of three uh indigenous native princesses uh, which I would also like to verify and um, explore someday soon. So there's a whole summer of exploration coming up. And it just keeps getting better. And Super better. cool. We I'll just have to uh, comments what? that there, it's like we need to be touching each other. I know it's kind of off subject, but I actually just... Yeah, I was with my neighbor. I had to go to the emergency room a couple times, and I did Reiki on her while we were in there. I was able to see in real time her blood pressure drop. So I'm, I agree. We need to hug each other more. There's actually like science behind that too. So just wanted to just saw that comment. Just wanted to put that out there. Sorry, I'm done now. I'll say goodbye. <laughs> oh, good sister. And that is Esra, aka Mindful Exposures, and. Here we go. There's your channel. It should be displaying. Is it? Oh, no. Come on. There we go. There we go. Okay. I need to start the marketer. I, uh, I don't have a ton of videos up, guys, but actually I do have videos that are, like, unlisted. And I'm showing people to kind of get their input before I start going live with all my stuff. So I will have, like, I just did a video on the Revigator or Radium Water. Um, so I'm kind of excited to do that. I could show you guys. It's five minutes, but I know, Bernie, you need to get going. Now. I, I got to get to work. I'm, I am sorry. Yeah, we can, I always show it another time. So anyway. Next um, episode, 100%. Thank you for sharing my stuff. Go check it out. There's go uh, check out Bob's channel. Bob's channel, Martin Fleischman. <laughs> memorial project then we have william's channel and anti-diluvian american uh 
as well as Frankie's channel in the West Reset. And I got to pull up WPG Enlightened for Truth, too, as Gerald's channel as well. Definitely also subscribe to uh, Gerald's channel. Good, good content. Just because I know somebody in the audience is thinking of asking but can't, what's your dog's name? This is actually my neighbor's dog. Uh, I'm watching him um, because she was in and out of the emergency room. So I just, but this is Kingston. He's, we call him the gentleman dog. And he's a cattle dog and chihuahua. <laughs> he's super cool. He's really, really well behaved. He listens really well. It's a cool he's name too, home. actually. Kingston. I like that. Isn't it? Oh, dear. And my dog's name is Ladybug. She's sleeping right now. I am back. I've got to go to work. I love you all. We Thank you. you. On the next one. Please don't end the money so he doesn't okay, have to everybody. work. Thanks, Bruce. <laughs> have a good one, everybody. Please do donate and you love you all. A ta ta. Catch you on the next one. Subscribe to New West Reset, WPG Enlightened for Truth, Mindful Exposures. Uh, Martin Fleischman Memorial Project, of course, and everybody else that has appeared.